Welcome everyone to Davos Fingers episode 141, The Chandrian. I'm Scad, and with me as always is my buddy Matt. Hello, Scad, and hello, lords and ladies. Uh, we're now over a hundred pages. Yeah. Lords and ladies coming to you live. Love it. From the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Utah. I think Lords and Ladies is a keeper. It feels good. Feels all right. <laughs> Lords and ladies, or whoever you want to be. Indeed. Whoever you are. Indeed. We welcome. Genderless nobility as well. Yep. <laughs> Everybody. You know, we're now over a hundred pages, which would normally be a significant number, but in this book, it's not even really a dent. Uh, into our coverage of The Name of the Wind, which, of course, is the first book in the King Killer Chronicle. Loving it so far. This episode, we are going to cover the chapters Puzzle Pieces Fitting, which is chapter 12, and we're going to chapter 17, which is an interlude called Autumn. It is, and a heartbreaker, that one, no spoilers. Uh, yeah, it, it's been, uh, it's been a month. We had uh, a great hangout earlier this month with some of our patrons, uh, a very informal chatty hangout. We talked about Mandalorian. We talked about Song of Madness, which we'll get to in a little bit. Thanks to everyone that participated. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a glorious little evening together. Yeah, it truly was. Yeah. Yeah. And what, um, we have something special coming up in April, right? I think so. Do it. I don't. I don't know. If heaven we, help us. Heaven help us if we can make it happen. My goodness. Yeah. I'm not sure if we got the date picked yet. Well, we, we are, don't. We don't yet. We're if we do, cover, I don't know it. <laughs> we're hoping to color cover Galahad uh, by Grant Piercy and have him on as a guest to talk about that with us, which will be super exciting. Uh, we plan to do that in February. Some things fell through personally and uh rescheduling that hopefully in april so look forward to that yes maybe putting it out into the air will help us like give (laughs) us that extra push to get that date yeah it's it's official now because it's been said and people have heard us say it right 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 um we're having some fun in a little tournament that we're doing we are we are it's been an interesting year for song of madness hasn't it it's been a lot of fun. The madness yeah. reigns. Um, let's see. We're on day 21 as yep. we speak right now. Uh, our biggest underdog out of the 96 competitors, Gendry at number 88, is still in. That's right. Which is pretty he's, exciting. He's still in. Yeah, we had Wyman sticking around for a while. He lost last round. The um, next closest to Gendry in terms of ranking, is Oberyn Martell at number 50. So Gendry at 80, 88 is uh, is killing it. So good job, buddy. In fact, does he go in tomorrow? Does he, I does he battle tomorrow? He does. Yes, I okay. think he, he's going up tomorrow against uh, against Lyanna, I think. That'll be, okay. That'll be, okay. might be a bloodbath. We'll see. Let's see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Go, Gendry! Underdogs uh, unite. Yep. Yep. And uh we've also got Ice and Fire Con is coming up. Uh for those for those going. Uh I will be there. Uh I'm excited. Uh the Davos Fingers participation in general a little bit a little bit down there that year. We're we're not doing our our uh our uh fandom favorite uh sponsorship there this year, but I will be there. I'm really excited to see friends. That is what Ice and Firecon is all about to me every year, is just getting to see the people I know and love and uh, getting to interact and talk and and get to know you guys better. Um, so I'm really excited about that. That's coming. That's uh, April 25th or 26th, I believe, is the start date. It um, goes there through through that Sunday, which is like the 31st. So really excited. As you should be. Yes. Okay. Let, let me know, as always, let me know if you're going, drop a line so I can look out for you. And uh, and please be gracious. Uh, I know people by their Twitter handles and sometimes not by their names. So if I don't immediately recognize you, have, have, have a little patience with me. 
I'm old and senile. That'll be three quarters of the people there, buddy. No worries. Yeah, probably true. Probably true. Well, uh, we are spoiler free for King Killer Chronicle. So uh, much like our Song of Ice and Fire coverage uh, in the days of yore, a long time ago now, uh, until the end of the podcast, we won't spoil anything beyond the text we're reading today. So don't you don't need to worry about that. We will have a special section at the end called Devi After Dark, in which we'll go into some of those things. So if you're interested in hearing things about the future uh, parts of the book, stick around for that section. Yeah. And, you know, shoot us a raven. We'd love to hear from you. It's fun to talk to you. Uh, you can find us at DavosFingers.com. We are DavosFingers at gmail.com. Twitter at, at DavosFingers. We're on Facebook. And please go and check out our Patreon program so you can come hang out with us and get access to special episodes and early ac- access to episodes like this and all sorts of fun stuff. That's at Patreon.com slash DavosFingers. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> well, if we're ready to just jump in, I think I've got the first chapter, which is called Puzzle Pieces Fitting. That would make me very happy. Let's do it. Let's do it. Young Quoth has continued his learning under Abenthe, mastering the latest in sympathy, much faster than expected, as we readers have already have grown to expect. Uh, So not unexpected for us. So as he went to Abenthe to get his next challenge and likely gloat about how fast he had finished the last challenge, he stumbled upon an unexpected conversation. His parents were grilling Abenthe about his knowledge of of the Chandri trying to learn all they could to confirm things they thought they knew. Gracie Arlidden was working on a song about the Chandrian, a secret song, a song he'd been working on for two years, and everyone in the troop was curious. Both couldn't help but sneak up and listen. To leave it short, what he learned about the Chandrian during that discussion, first, chasing this story has been like chasing a ghost, but it feels important to Arlidden. There are seven of the Chandrian, for sure. It's even in the name, haven't they confirms. Chan means seven, seven of them. No rhyme or reason to when they come. They just seem to bring destruction and no one knows why. Arlidan thinks he knows that reason, but he doesn't give it to us. Come on, Pat. There are lots of signs that seem to kind of signify they're coming. There's blue flame, eyes like a goat or no eyes or black eyes, plants that are around you die, wood rots, metal rusts, brick crumbles, cold to the touch, yoked to shadow. They're said to be yoked to shadow the Chandrian. Lorian thinks it's one sign for each member of the Chandrian. They each have one that they take with them, but they don't always have to be together. So all the stories are dealing with a combination of the Chandrian, and sometimes some signs are there and sometimes others are not. They talk for a good long while to come to some of these conclusions, but when Arludin tries to name the Chandrian that he knows, Abanthi asks him respectfully, please don't. There's superstition and there's common sense. Stay away from the things that all people are afraid of. Arludin and Lorian are both surprised at his superstition, but Ben explains it well. If everyone in town tells you there's a boogeyman in the forest, you may not believe there's a boogeyman as such, But do you go into the forest? You don't. And it's the same with the Chandrian. There is power in names and folk everywhere are afraid of the Chandrian. Even if we don't know why, there's some reason for it. Best be stay safe and stay away. They agree to move on and the conversation turns to Quoth himself. Quoth is rather bright. As a matter of fact, bright doesn't begin to cover it. Ben continues to point out how bright. He learned the lute at a young age and only had to be taught the chords once, he he, he bets. And he's like that with everything. He understands everything quickly. And not just that, but uses his understanding to move beyond the teachings he's been given to teach himself more things before Ben even can. What is it you suggest we do? Just to think about the options and support him. Ben believes Quoth will become one of the best in history at whatever he chooses to focus on. Music, business, the arcane. Ben adds that he could easily get into the university when he's a little older, and Quoth can hardly contain himself at the thought of attending university. All those books. They wonder aloud how they had created such a special boy, if somehow Lorian had slept with a god. But she jokes with Arlidin, and they have a nice romantic cuddling moment, the way Quoth likes to remember his parents. And that is the end of the chapter. 
the way close parents are written is just lovely yeah i yeah agree it's everything it's, i want it, yep yeah <laughs> i have a, I have a few notes about that in this uh in my notes here uh, in two or three of the chapters and and also you know it's been said and i've i've said it that you know i don't think patrick does a great job with the female characters in this first book i think he does better in the second one um about giving them frankly about giving them much to do and much agency um but the quality of Lorian needs to be stated. She's the cleverer, I think, of Quoth's two parents. She's got the better memory, the quicker tongue. Um, she she brings up that it was just the size of his hands that made him struggle with the loot, you know, not any sort of struggle with understanding or technique. It was just a physical limitation because the kid was like seven, you know. <laughs> Just her little like quips and stuff are so yes. funny. The one where she yeah. talks about his uh the mind goes second in a man. <laughs> yes, yes, right. <laughs> right. They have the a clear, you know, sexual uh jab. And yeah, they have a very, like you said, they have a great little relationship. Almost and too good to be true. Almost. Mm. Mm. Spoiler for the spoiler chapter. after. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up. Yeah. They die. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. I mean, almost too good to be true in general, not just the two of them, but the, the life in general. I mean, what a life. Right. I, yeah. I think I kind of said this last episode too, but <clears throat> um, just, it seems so perfect. Yeah. Friends traveling together, sharing things together, like a little commune. You know, In fact, Ben brings that up as one of the reasons why Kvothe's so smart, right? Yeah, is the community. Just, yeah, that sense of community that he has, the access to all sorts of different personality types and talents. And yep. and yeah, just, just the overall sense of open-mindedness as well and the encouragement to explore and to learn and to develop. Um, yeah, it's it's conducive to becoming a very well-rounded person, I think. How, uh, yeah, and the environment is huge, as it is, you know, in, in our world. But Quoth is special, too. Sure. I mean, like, how no question. How, how long did it pick, take you to pick up the guitar? Right. I have I'm no still, idea. I'm still picking it up. <laughs> yeah, right. Right? Right? Yeah, to underscore the point, yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, um, like, I yeah, I, I noted that as well. Tom Morello, famed mm. guitarist of Rage Against the Machine. Rage. Yep. Um, audio slave uh solo project does a lot of stuff um he said that at his peak you know late teen years and into his early 20s he would practice for eight hours a day Oof, man a full-time I, job i barely sleep eight hours a day i do not sleep eight hours. yeah <laughs> yeah that's fair yeah. <laughs> yeah you can tell All right. a little rough eight hours a day every yeah. day that's right? crazy. And he's a guitar god. He's brilliant. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. So. Do you want to talk a little bit about the tease we get for the Chandrian in this chapter? Yeah, I'll couch it in this. One of my main notes of this chapter is just the the brilliant world building that takes place in this chapter so much mm. so that I didn't, it didn't really impact me or it wasn't something that stuck out because it's so easily woven into just the dialogue and the immediacy of the chapter. But when you step back and look at it, and I noticed it on my second or third read through, you learn about this legend of a guy named Lanre. You learn about all about the Chandrian, about all these different aspects we'll talk about in just a second. You learn about different languages and you get an idea for how long civilization has been around when they when they say that the language called Temic predates the language Tema by a thousand years. Yeah. So you start to get some idea of the expansiveness and the history of this civilization. You learn about different superstitions and fears throughout this known world. Atur, Ventus, the Commonwealth. You learn about this famous singer who sounds to me like the Bob Dylan kind of of this area, Ilian, who's mm -hmm. written all the great songs, right, that everyone knows about. And it's so intricately woven into this 
chapter 12 of this huge book uh, that you come away knowing the world just a little better while not sacrificing the story. Story The story is still moving forward. So expertly done. Yeah, something we're used to with George, right? I think we, sure. we make that note with George a lot. Too, also something George does well. He yeah. just weaves these little intricate historical details into a paragraph of a chapter. And all of a sudden your understanding of the world is richer for it, mm-hmm. right? And you don't even know he's done it. It's so right. expertly done. Very similar, right? Shamble mm-hmm. men. I don't know what a shamble man is, but I know people are afraid of them. And I'm excited to, I'm, I'm excited to learn more. He's... He's got that little hook in me. I want to know. I hope yep. I, I hope I find out. They're yep. probably not real, so I probably won't, but I'm still excited. You get a little hint of what of, of religion and the life that it and the impact that it has in the lives of people mm-hmm. and the way that they're talking about it, and you relate to it, right? You're like, oh yeah, I know people like that. Faux show. Sure. Yeah, we're gonna get a lot more into the religion uh coming up here uh in uh in Devi After Dark too as part of the background of some of these stories but uh yeah it's it's an interesting part of this whole world building that that pat does the Mm -hmm. the involvement of of the religion because i would say you know like a song of ice and fire the religion is i don't know that it's overpowering but it's there there's lots of them it's brought up a lot it's brought up almost as just a backdrop of part of a characteristic of who people are it doesn't feel like a huge part of this world to so far, right? That we've heard. Yeah. Like it doesn't seem to drive a lot, but it's there and it's for sure a big deal. And he just kind of introduces it slowly. Yeah, which makes sense because a lot of this is is it's fo- it's both telling the story. Yeah. You grew up in a not religious at all environment. Yeah. Right? So it makes sense that we're kind of just seeing it on the perimeter or on the fringes yeah. of society so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk Chandrian, like you were saying. Sure. Yeah. Um, the wind picks up as they start to talk about the Chandrian, and knowing what happens later in these set of chapters, you know, you wonder if if this was if that meant something. If Pat's trying to really cue something there, um, we we know that uh, we know that in the in the future chapters here but they're kind of somehow listening, right? They're hearing something. Yeah. Like they have like a radar or something, something that that uh is alerted by their names. Yeah. A discussion about them. Um, We hear, we hear about these signs that kind of tell they're coming. I won't, we'll we'll talk more about them in Debbie after dark, but fire damp is an interesting one. They talk about the blue flame and, and it's a little weird two paragraph, three paragraph diversion where they talk about the fire being blue when they're, when the chanting are around and Lorian in a little, you know, good bit that I was talking about with, with giving, giving Lorian some, you know, some, uh, some real substance mentions that fire damp in mines also causes blue flame. And I thought it was maybe throwaway. And I'm like, is it? Cause, cause it, why write like, it? Why write it? Right. It's the mm-hmm. old Chekhov thing. Yeah. And so I started looking and we'll get more into it in Debbie, Debbie After Dark as well. But fire damp, I didn't know that. I didn't even know fire damp is a thing. It's a real thing in our in our world. Uh, it's just a set of gases, several different mm-hmm. types of combinations of gases found in mines that are flammable. So if you have fire down that'll light your way, explosions can happen, right? So they actually invented like whole new lamps to try to keep fire damp from exploding during mining and they were pretty effective but still occasionally accidents happened and things and and even just uh you know striking you know coal or, or something with your pickaxe could cause a spark that could still ignite fire damp sure. even with the better lamps but i wondered about you know the presence of carbon in the coal right that makes because uh carbon carbon monoxide uh, makes a blue flame, right? Like the Chandrian do. And so I wonder if he's merging in some science, some real science into, you know, some of these Chandrian signs. And I, I did some research on that. We'll talk more about it later. But uh, I'd never heard of fire damp. 
but I hope hope if you hadn't, now you know what it is. Yeah. Well, it, very good. Very well explained. Uh, in fact, we'll find later that Ben actually pivots after an accident Quoth has to focusing primarily on chemistry with mm-hmm. him. He does indeed. And you wonder if there's something to that. Might be. Uh, hmm. Arladen, this, go ahead. No, that's, go, please. Arladen talks about, uh, you know, this story that he's, this song that he's writing, um, you know, and, and Abathy worries about the names. Um, and we know, you know, this is a theme we'll see in this book for sure, that names are very important. Names, in fact, are part of are are part of the structure of the story, right? Uh, your your name has power, and Avanthi is worried about saying those you know saying those names out loud. You can mm-hmm. scratch them in the dirt, he says, but don't don't say it out loud. And Arlen responds, he's like, I'm I'm deconstructing a story here. I'm not meddling in the dark arts. And well, well, you are. Turns out you kind of are. Turns out you kind of are. Yeah. There's a lot of foreshadowing in this chapter. A ton. Yeah. 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 Um, you got anything else for this chapter? I do not. Not too many notes on this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, eyes that look like they want to swallow up the world. They say of, of Quoth's eyes. Uh, that's another Lorian quote. Um, and you wonder if that's also somewhat uh, somewhat of a prognostication, right? Because we know that folk becomes someone who has a tremendous impact on this world and maybe almost, we don't know, we, we really don't know, but maybe almost wrecks, wrecks it, right? Um, based on the way he kind of talks about his behavior that he's made mistakes, big ones, right? The fact that it's called the King Killer Chronicle by itself implies that he's done some things that are beyond the station of a, a simple performer boy, you know, mm-hmm. raised by the Adimaru. And uh, eyes that look like they want to swallow up the world is how Lorian described him as a boy. So just interesting to note. Indeed. Yep. Shall we move on? Yes. Flesh with blood beneath is the next one. Both is parched. He hasn't been telling many stories lately. We're back now in the inn, uh, in interlude. I'd be parched. I'd be parched as well. I'm parched already. You've seen me take like nine drinks over here. My Goodness gracious. He's... A good storyteller used to telling stories, but he hasn't been telling them lately. And he stops this one to get himself a drink and the chronicler some chocolate, which is what he asks for. He also summons Bast. Bring up some cider, would you? Instead of helping, Bast pretends to be busy. He comes upstairs regardless, feigning anger that Quoth has interrupted his studies with a book he never reads, the Selim Tinture. For a single customer? You couldn't handle a single customer? Quoth knows he's been eavesdropping, though, and calls him on it, and Bast is ashamed at being caught. With that, Quoth turns to introduce Bast to Chronicler, but finds Chronicler very involved in the conversation already, and in Bast himself. Bast may have looked like a beautifully put-together human with striking blue eyes and black boots, but the right mind could see the truth, could see that there was something special about those eyes, and that Bast was not exactly what he appeared to be. The color had drained from Chronicler's face as he pulled a metal disc from his neck and placed it firmly on the table. Iron, he said. Bast doubled over in pain at the command and made ready to attack the Chronicler. But Quoth gripped his arm hard, holding Bast firmly in place as he struggled to get to the Chronicler. Undo that or I will break it, he commanded Chronicler. He does, and Bast collapses onto a stool, the glamour broken, his eyes now their true form, deep ocean blue of a single collar. And not boots, but cloven hooves for feet. Both starts over with a proper, if angry, and impatient introduction between the two. Chronicler, a storyteller, accomplished member of the Arcanum and Namer, and Bastus, Prince of Twilight, and of the Telwith Male, 
glamourer, bartender, and friend. He then chides both of them for being foolish, despite their many years and many learnings. They both made a very dangerous attack at someone who could do them very real harm. There's no reason for the two of you to be anything other than friends, and that is not how friends greet each other. If there's one thing I will not abide, it is the folly of a willful pride. His intensity broke the stare between Parker and Bass, and when they looked at both, they didn't see the kind innkeeper, but a man dark and fierce and imposing. Parker was afraid of this man that he knew could break him like a stick. This was the man he came to see. Bass and Chronicler shake hands, surprised to find flesh with blood beneath. Both tells them to sit and talk while he assembles lunch, and they do, but awkwardly. Chronicler watches Quoth go about his business and can't believe that this man doing his chores was the same one that had been seen behind the bar moments ago. Both sits down to tell the story again, grateful that Bass had heard everything as they didn't have time to backtrack before the story shifted into a darker turn. And that's the end of the chapter. These little interludes are fun. Um, I agree. It's mentioned again that in the Waystone Inn, there was a silence. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, Quoth is surrounded by hustle and bustle as a child, right? It's all about what he's learning, the recitations, the songs, the japes, the constant motion and activity. Energy, always in that camp, right? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, there's an energy. It's always buzzing. It's always buzzing. Yeah. But yet in this life that he's leaving, leading right now is marked more by its silences, which... You have to think is something he kind of wants um, as he's trying to stay hidden, but it's also something he chafes under. Uh, and there's so much said in these silences. It's just fascinating to see that jumping yeah. from one world to the other. Yeah. Does he like the silence or does he hate it? I think he definitely does, hates it. And, and, and sometimes maybe appreciates it, but then right. goes immediately back to hating it. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like the dentist. I appreciate the dentist. I don't love it. It's <laughs> yeah, a good comparison. In the last in the last episode we did, you know, we we talked a little bit about that. That you know, it it seems like this is somewhat at odds at him. He he has the sword and he posts it up there. It's like he's tempting fate a little bit mm -hmm. by like advertising it, like inviting danger almost. And and similar with the story, in the last episode we talk about you know. He doesn't want to tell the story. I don't want to tell it. I don't want to tell it. Twist my arm. Fine. Okay. I'll tell it. You have to stay. Okay. For these okay. okay. You have to. <laughs> no, no, there's no bargaining. You're staying. I'm telling it. And yeah, you get the sense there's a little pride in him while he's telling it. I have a note about that, that line about not accepting. Uh, one thing I will not abide. It is the folly of a willful pride, which is hilarious. Because he's a very proud individual. He's a very willfully proud person. Yeah. yeah. He's and a we very proud know, we individual. We haven't seen a lot of it yet, but this story is set <laughs> beyond most of the events of this book. He, you know, he's he's lived a life full of willful mm -hmm. pride at this point, and he makes this statement. Uh, and it's great writing from Patrick. Yeah. We see you, quote. Oh, we yeah. see you, brother. We see what you're doing. Stop <laughs> it. Uh, this uh, Bast thing is awfully interesting. Sure. Just that idea of the glamour. I think we're kind of accustomed to it coming from, it's very similar to what glamours are in Germ's world. And I, you know, as well, you know, better than most that I'm not too embedded in the fantasy world is glamoring kind of a common thing that we see in other fantasy series and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, this seems very similar to Germ's glamoring at, at least in the sense of, you know, if light catches them a certain way, or if you look closely here, you're going to see little hints where things are shimmering or things don't quite look the same. Uh, it feels very similar in that regard. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I agree. In these two worlds, they feel similar, right? The the manse glamour, uh, perhaps some of the stuff Melisander does in A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, similar to 
you know, to some of this stuff that, that it seems Bast has going on. He calls him a glamorer as if it's uh, a skill that some people have. Yeah. It, it feels like most fantasy treats it more like temporary illusions. Like mm-hmm. when I need to fool someone, I can't, you know, D and D for sure. There are spells like minor illusion spells and major illusion spells gotcha. where you can, where you can have an effect on somebody for a time, but it doesn't seem permanent. These are permanent glamours, um, or at least semi-permanent, right? Um, that that seem to stick with them for long periods of time. And I don't know. I, I don't. I'm certainly, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings has, um, you know, the interesting thing that happens with Theoden. Um, I wouldn't call that glamour. It's more of a magical f- effect over time. Of it's a know, good call. Poisoning his mind, I suppose. But yeah. it's not really a glamour. That's more of a, a real physical impact. Yeah. The poisoning of his mind had a physical manifestation on his body. Yeah. Yeah. And the ring affects Gollum in a similar way. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a physical effect. There's much his, more his... an actual, yeah, affecting their physiology. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not a glamour at all. It's real. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think, yeah, I feel, I feel like most other series that I remember, it's, it's more temporary effects. Right. Way, rather than permanent ones of of hiding. But you know, I'm 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 also not a fantasy expert. I've read a few, but yeah. Yeah. It seemed it seemed, you know, so casually similar to to the glamoring yeah. that aspect of glamour. Now we don't know that it's the glamour is cast in the same way as it is in a song of ice and fire, but just that idea of it of being able to see through that shimmery curtain a little bit sometimes if your eyes are not focused on it or, you know, things of that nature, but it's really cleverly told. I love how, you know, that I caught this the third time reading it because I'm slow like that. Uh, the chroniclers hearing the sound of someone climbing a set of wooden stairs and hard soled boots. But then when it's mm-hmm. describing Bast, it says he's got black pants tough oh. into soft black boots, you know, that's funny. So, I, because I read that soft black, I didn't, I didn't connect it to the stair bit, but I read the soft black boots. I'm like, interesting, soft black. I don't ever look at someone's boots and look, they look soft, soft. But, yeah, yeah. I don't ever, I don't ever think that. But I wonder if that was a clever little, just yeah, for sure it was hint. Yeah, good, good pull. That the Doc Martins were not Doc Martins. <laughs> <laughs> they were cloven hooves instead. They were cloven hooves. Yeah. Uh, striking nonetheless, it sounds like. Um, and I think I'll just, you know, I, I think I speculated in a previous episode that Bast was a demon. I think I'll just pull back on that hard. Feels like in this introduction that he gives, it feels like he's more, more just a fey creature. Um, yeah. But, he seems, uh, he seems good natured enough until you bind him with iron. Yes. Or whatever is happening there. Is that yes. how you understood it? That's how I understood it. Yeah, it's um, both says that Chronicler is one of uh, two uh, what, two score people. So one, one out of you know one of forty people in the mm-hmm. entire world that knows the name of Iron, and um, yeah, it looks like Iron, even just its name and presence, if called upon. I, I don't know how it works. I, you know, even you know, having read these books a few times, I, like. If he just like if he were looking at the chimney and said iron, would it still have affected Bass the same way? Is it like a spell he casts by looking at him and calling that name, like applying the name of iron to Bast specifically? I don't know. It's interesting though that simply saying that word could have an effect on Bass like that. It's so interesting. I wonder if it had something to do with the alar and having to have that belief. Yeah. Because it and does you know, say he muttered some words, right? Right. I think, and then said the, and then said it. And he did it so quickly. So it's one yeah. who's very well practiced in it, obviously. Yes. But just that idea of, you know, where, where Quoth in, a, you know, in this very next chapter, I think it is. Yeah. He, he's able to bind the air in his lungs to the air outside. Right. Yes. And if in the same sense, he's binding that iron to bast in essence bringing those two together and how painful that must be for bast like almost it says it felt like you got kicked in the nuts but 
he says in a later chapter, it, yeah, felt, like he got, yeah. it felt like he got kicked in the nuts, but all over. All, all <laughs> and over. it's almost Imagine... like just getting slapped with a huge slab of iron, just <clears throat> your whole body. You know, For the men listening, imagine you're just one big nut. You are just a huge testicle. And you get kicked. That's the <laughs> best as a physical. Like. Just a huge drooping testicle. So I, I want to address that because I went back and looked at the text here. And we know that with the ALAR and the, um, you know, the sigildry work, the, the sympathy work, rather, that you have to, you have to speak, you know, a, a binding, right? To like combine these things and it's, almost like a chemical or chemical, but it's a, it's a reaction, almost a a scientific reaction. And he both has made a point of kind of differentiating that from naming calling the wind. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it says, it doesn't say that he mutters any words or anything to do a binding. He He just just says iron. iron. And so this is like a naming thing and maybe not a binding thing, like a sympathy thing. Um, And it just happens that, for whatever reason, maybe Bast has a weakness to iron. Yeah. The Fey, the Fey in general, maybe have a weakness to iron. He does say in that chapter 17, you only tried to bind me. Oh, interesting. But I, it yeah. could be different because like you're saying, he's just using the one, he's just calling the name. Yeah. Right. But, oh, like, yeah, that's interesting. So is it just the use of the word bind that he used? And like, he could have picked a different verb if he wanted. You only, you're only trying to hold me. Or right. you know, like, or sure. whether, or whether that meant, you know, it, like that naming has a, a binding principle underneath. Just by saying the name, you can skip, you know, the right. the the the, the, ALR, the the muttering and all the, you know, the right. saying the binding. Right, the name itself is powerful enough to just hold that and do things. It's yeah, because we see that in the next chapter, we're getting ahead of ourselves, and I'm just going down that hole. Let's just it's do all it. good, man. Um, we're here. Ben speaks the name of the wind at mm-hmm. least to quoth's ears mm-hmm. uh to save him right yeah and I'm so very confused about it go ahead there's yeah there's i mean i don't have a, a super deep conclusion to arrive at just that there does seem to be some sort of power that can act on individuals mm-hmm. simply by naming the wind just or like, naming like, naming right. the substance when he and said, I wonder if some of it is is mental, is like the Alar, something that's going on in his head. Yeah, that a belief, right? right? They talk about the importance of belief in yeah. the last block of chapters that we read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Combined yeah. with, you know, being able to, <sighs> because how does the wind know what to do? The last time he called the wind, it shook his his wagon and scared the you know the the sheriff away or whatever, and just shook things. And this time when he calls the wind again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, it like extracts the wind from Quoth's body. So like he's calling it and telling it what to do, but he didn't, through, do, he didn't, he didn't through, do anything through like his- Through some sort of belief. Yeah. And command. Through, yeah. Right. Yeah. Through his soul or his, yeah. Right. It's interesting. It's him yeah. imposing his will upon yeah. the substance. Yeah. And in some way, having that act upon the person, whether it's the whole wind outside, every particle of air outside, or just a little iron coin. Yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. I know they're just words, 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 as Hamlet would say, but uh, they sometimes he uses the word calling the wind, right? Like it's it. It is naming. He's summoning it. It's summoning it to do whatever mm-hmm. it is that you've got, you know, in your soul, your mind, and your command that you want to do. You're calling it. You're calling iron to do your bidding. In this mm-hmm. case, he called iron to bind Bast, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah, interesting. Like, could, kind he have, of, could he have called it to strike him down, you know, to hit him in the head? To Maybe. We don't know. We don't know yet. Right. That's cool. This is yeah, fun. it's similar to the force Nerding in that regard. It's not Ooh. an apples to apples comparison, but that idea that the force is always out there, and then through your abilities, through practice and much learning and everything and experience, you are able to summon it to do yeah. your will, whether yes. for evil or for good. Yeah, I'm reading one of those books for the Legends Lounge, which we'll both be guesting on. 
uh, soon, someday. Legends Lounge Star Wars podcast hosted by our buddy Aaron Motes. Check it out. Check it out. Uh, and first of all, they pulled some real shenanigans in the first book in that series we're reading. Oh, and buddy. I want to talk to you about it because I'm oh, angry. Oh, buddy. You should but, be. But I'm I'm amazed at how much those novels expound on what you can do with the Force. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's it's really interesting the way they talk about it. And I agree. Yeah, it feels like feels like they're summoning it to do yeah they're they're bidding but also it's something they have to play with not something they can just use it's you know it's an entity itself and Mm -hmm. you know by knowing how to use the force they can they can make it do these things if they're good enough perhaps similar with naming except it feels like maybe once you know the name you can make it do whatever you want so there's not like that that force growth maybe it's interesting yeah yeah, because the force is very much like an entity in of itself. Like you said, it's like you hear it a lot, the will of the force, mm-hmm. the will of the force. But then also it's very much people imposing their will upon the force almost. Yeah. Um, usually that's the dark side. But uh, but your relationship with the force keeps growing and growing and growing, right? Yeah, to the Does point that you can take stronger. an X-wing out of the water or whatever, the swamp. Right. But, but does your does your does your relationship with the name of the wind or the name of iron grow and get grow. stronger or like once you know it, you just kind of know it. Or is it more like your belief in your ability to mm. summon it grows the more you're able to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, yeah, but I don't think the wind can ever give you the middle finger like the force can. Right. Sure. Because sometimes it feels like the force, like, either well i don't know if the force lets them down or they're just not strong in the force at that moment or whatever but it feels like it's it's not a it's not a given like you could fail right with the force mm-hmm. it could it could not respond to you you know we see luke you know try to lift the rocks or, or try to lift the the x wing and fail right mm, that actually makes me kind of believe almost more in this idea of belief because like the force never gave Darth Vader the middle finger when he used it to choke people out, right? And you think yeah, that, that it, belief it would, right? Yeah, you'd think. Yeah. Then yeah, he Luke understood. Yeah. Yeah. And what is it that Yoda says to him? I couldn't do it. Or what did he say? What does Luke say? There's no try. And and oh. no, well, Yoda repli- Yoda's reply to him is that is why you fail. What is it that oh it's too uh, big. It's it's too big or something like that. Right. Right. Didn't he say that? Yeah. But he says something else for that is why you fail. I, I don't believe I can do it or I, something. Yeah. Oh no. It, it's Yoda. Does it? This is what it Yoda lifts it out of the water. I've seen this movie 300 times. Oh, and yeah, I don't believe back it. To me. Yeah. And he says, I don't, says believe it, right? I don't believe it. And that then Yoda says, that is why you fail. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So it's belief, man. It's self-confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you start with little rocks with the force and then work your way up because that belief grows stronger. Oh, I did it with a pebble. Okay. Now I did it with a stone. Okay. Now I did it with my dog. Like, and then mm-hmm. my R2 unit. And here we go. And then the next swing. Potentially. This is not a Star Wars podcast as much <laughs> as I sometimes want it to be. Well, um. <laughs> let Aaron take care of that. Uh, so I, I buried underneath all of this naming conversation and how it works is holy shit, Chronicler's a namer. Yeah. So we don't he's know how not not just a, a journalist. Yeah. He's a member of the Arcanum at the university, which we don't know a lot about yet, but we're about to learn more. Uh achieving at least the rank of Raylar, which again we don't know much about, but we'll learn more soon. Sounds good. Um and one of 40 people that know the name of Iron, like we said, that's interesting. That's it's super uh, interesting. He's one of 40 people that has this extreme power and he's chosen to write stories down instead, mm-hmm. which, you know, we've been through in the last episode. He is a tremendous talent for, but uh, interesting that he's not really pursuing the arcane arts despite knowing them. He reminds me a lot of Ben. Mm. In fact, sometimes I found myself having like, Trouble differentiating the two of them or thinking they were the same person. Ben, yeah. what's Ben doing traveling traveling around in a little cart? You yeah. know, doing little yeah. odd jobs for people and stuff. If he can do all this crap. 
Yeah. You know, and he's so like blown away by Kvothe's abilities. And then here you've got the Chronicler kind of doing the same thing. What's this guy doing out just chasing down stories and everything, writing stuff down, getting robbed on the road and every that guy could have we found out we found out in this chapter, this guy could have wasted the trap the the robbers, the roadside thieves that took all his stuff. Probably. I mean, I don't know if he knows other names. If it just knows iron, I don't know if iron could do the same thing to to the humans, to humans. But it does to Faye. I don't well, I don't know. Maybe I, don't know. It can. I feel like he could have figured something out. Yes, it feels that way. <laughs> but he just didn't want the trouble. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about that. And and Ben's Ben's origins too. I haven't really thought much about that. Like, is he running from something? Did yeah, are they trying just have to a, hide? Yeah, did he have something go bad? Is Which there is... just not much to like? I know people are superstitious, maybe not a lot of demand for namers which would be surprising but like yeah which is you know, strange like, because the chandrian are trying to hide too yeah and, and, well it's implied that they are yes. we'll get to that but we will yeah. interesting interesting also is it interesting something both did that makes them want to hide well that's before ben or that's after ben but after ben for sure but yeah yeah but but maybe some of the similar similar themes Make, mm-hmm. make maybe making them hide. Uh, so Quoth can turn this, it seems like he can turn this attitude on in seconds. He can just, and you know, I it'd be cool yeah. if this was just actor training or something, but it almost feels like. Uh, I don't want to put it this way because I. I don't mean it exactly. I'm not trying to spread some crazy net, you know, conspiracy net or something, but like, it's almost like there's two people in there. Yeah. Like he, did we talk about this last episode that like, no. maybe he's broken his mind so. into two personalities. Right. Right. Like he's got an, I A-log think you going. did bring that. Yeah. I think you did. And it's bring like, that up. there's two of them and yeah. he just switches back and forth. Like whenever he wants. Right. Yeah. And maybe that's, I like that. I actually like that. It is very conspiracy. Yeah, uh, it is, but I like that. It could be that he's trying to keep himself in silence because it helps him maintain more of just the normalcy yeah. and, and not fall into that going both ways. Maybe it was one of the, one of his sides that, came out and it's that side that we saw when he stopped the confrontation between Bast and Chronicler that led him to getting into some of this mess. Maybe that's some of the folly that he's talking about yeah. and that Ben warns him against. Uh, it's the sword that's hanging on the wall. It's that yeah. side of him um, that is now that he's trying to temper by putting himself into more peaceful, silent situations. That's an interesting thought. I like it, buddy. Pouring the drink changed him back to the innkeeper. Almost, yeah. right? Like he's this furious, ferocious man. And he's like, fix it. And then he goes, pours a drink. And Chronicle's like, it's a different dude doing that. Yeah. It like, just like melts off him. I'm yeah. trying to think if it would be more effective or less to be able to split that in your mind like that, to leave a personality behind if you're trying to hide. Mm-hmm. Like he, like he, he like, Sometimes with trauma, right? Like we bury parts of ourselves or because we're trying to get away from something, we you know, get us some new social security number and like become a different person, right? And we have to just kind of leave those things behind. But in movies, it's always hard for them, right? They always kind of come back to the person they are and their past follows them somehow and they can't let it go. But if you can break your mind in two and really leave it behind. Compartmentalize. And compartmentalize it. Maybe that's helpful. And Maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. You brought up his abilities as an actor, and I do think that that's part of it. Yeah. I, you know, the training that he got, we're going to talk about in a later chapter, is how his dad really dedicated himself to teaching Quoth those different little mannerisms and tics and everything that can kind of put you into the right character. Yeah. And I think there's some of that too. But yeah. it, I agree that it can't just be all that. There's also something I'm not else convinced. going on. I just wonder, right? I, I think it could be. It could just be, you know, him putting on characters. But mm-hmm. it but that that Alar would maybe add add to the ability to to spice it up a little. 
give it more, I don't know, more uh, authenticity. Yeah. Interesting. An interesting five pages. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about those five pages for a bit, huh? Mm -hmm. Sometimes these interludes, they're pretty like meaty with trying to put the story together. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay. Let's go back in time. Whoa. Uh, Huey Lewis. Huey. Huey. Huey's bringing the Huey. Um, That is on Back to the Future, right? It's got to be. Yeah. It's, I think it's at the end of number one. Sure. Um, I know it's chap- there somewhere. Chapter 14, The Name of the Wind. But that's the name of the book. Yeah, it's the name of a chapter two, okay? It is. Winter had turned to spring, and spring was turning to summer, and Kvothe was disappointed. Sympathy was cool and all. And he didn't completely hate it when Ben would play his, how would you use sympathy games with him? Like, how would you bring a kettle of water to boil? Or how would you bring down that bird? It was on this latter question that young Foth finally, after some smart alekiness, answers, I'd simply call the wind and make it strike the bird from the sky. And when Ben, with a calculating look, asked how he planned to do that, here's what Quoth himself said happened. I drew in a deep breath and spoke the words to bind the air in my lungs to the air outside. I fixed the alar firmly in my mind, put my thumb and forefinger in front of my pursed lips, and blew between them. There was a light puff of wind at my back that tousled my hair and caused the tarpaulin covering the wagon to pull taut for a moment. It might have been something more than a coincidence, but nevertheless, I felt an exultant smile overflow my face. For a second, I did nothing but grin like a maniac at Ben, his face dull with disbelief. But that is when everything went wrong, listeners. Quoth felt something squeeze his chest, and suddenly he couldn't breathe. Felt like all the air had been driven from his body. He thrashed, he clawed, but nothing. Ben notices and throws him to the ground, kneels above him, and with eyes far away, and, quote, filled with a terrible power, dispassionate and cold, end quote, called the wind. The next thing Quoth knew, he was on his back, breathing again. Ben was calming the onlookers, including Quoth's mom, saying something about Quoth taking a tumble or something. But when they were all gone, Ben let his furiousness show. What were you thinking, he hissed. And then the gravity of what Quoth had done hit him. Remember one of the laws of sympathy where if you bind a piece of iron that you're holding to another piece of iron that you're not holding and you use that binding to lift the piece you're not holding, it will feel like you're actually lifting two whole pieces, even though you've only got one in your hand. Yeah, it's the same thing. But in this case, Kvothe bound his breath to all of the air outside and his lungs simply couldn't handle it. It was a nearly fatal mistake. And Ben knew it. After passing the rest of the day in silence and stopping at a gray stone for the night, Ben finally confronts Quoth with the truth. Someone thoughtless can mostly be harmless, but someone as clever as Quoth who's also thoughtless, that's one of the most terrifying things there is. The reader senses a tinge of regret in Ben's voice as he admits that the things he's been teaching Quoth, things he learned in a university setting at 18 to 20 years old, are too dangerous for a child of only 12 years old, not even 12 yet, even if it's easy to forget uh, that the clever Quoth is really that young. And although Ben never formalized any decision on the future of Quoth's education with him, it wasn't quite the same after that day. He stuck with chemistry, tinged with a trickle of sympathy, a certain caution hovering over all, despite their still close relationship. Quoth tried to be patient, figuring that with time, this would all smooth over and things would go back to the where they were. But little did he know that their time together was quickly drawing to an end. End of chapter. Yeah, I, lo- I love the way you described that with comparing it to the, the little ingots uh, <laughs> exercise. A really good illustration with the air. And man, like it just, this, this you know, again, I've read these books a few times, but maybe it's just the age my kids are, are now that it struck me, but um. 
he binds the air to his lungs in an effort to call the wind because that's what he knows how to do. Mm -hmm. He's been given a tool to do something similar to what he wants to do. So he'll give it a go. And if you give a hammer to a kid, they'll use that hammer for whatever they can smashing think of. things. So you, yeah. yeah, whatever they, they can think of. Pounding on with. things. Mm -hmm. Ben has given Quoth an immense amount of power by teaching him sympathy to someone who's very young. And if you don't teach, if you don't teach kids the things that they're curious about, they're going to go learn it themselves by trying stuff. They're going to try stupid shit to figure it out. Or they're going to ask somebody else untrustworthy if you won't tell them. It's hard as a parent knowing what they're ready for. My kids, my, my 10 year old, especially is coming home with all sorts of questions. <laughs> dad, dad, what's the C word? Oh my God. Really? <laughs> you don't, you don't need to know that right now. You know, like I'll tell you when it's appropriate. When's it appropriate? When's he going to figure out that he can just Google that himself? Right. Like when, how long do you keep kids in the dark on things that you don't think they're ready for? If they show a question, if they have a question about it before they hurt themselves, doing it themselves without your guiding hand. Right. Dad, what's come. Oh my God. Got that one the other day. Like, okay. Uh, maybe we need to talk. You've been about listening this. to Davos fingers, son. Like, Okay, you know, and we're not, we're like, you're 10. You don't need to know any of this yeah, stuff. Right. But I don't want him to find out from somebody find else out. either. Yeah, if you tell him, you get to control it's the message in a way. A little bit. And, you know, there's something to be said for kids just learning on their own. There are certainly parenting styles out there that would just let them go learn, you know, however you learn, learn. But that's not my stuff. And, you know, it, it's not exactly the same, but. Ben is, is, he's, both has clearly shown an interest in this. And instead of giving him much, he just kind of keeps, keeps it hidden. And naming is a very complicated thing. And just like he says at the end of the chapter, if I give him sympathy, he's super powerful already for 12. I didn't learn this stuff till I was 18 and had some more wisdom to know how to use it. If I give him naming at 12, well, right. I can't do that. It'd be irresponsible. But at the same time, he almost killed himself trying to figure it out. There's a it's a, it's a wicked line, man. Correct. Yeah. Do you think so? Kvoth is thinking that when he first brings up, I just call the name of the wind and it would strike the bird down. He almost detects or he infers a little bit of softening in Ben and he thinks. I think, I think this is a moment I'm going to finally learn it. And then of course he tries it himself just to try mm -hmm. to impress Ben and show that maybe he's ready for it. And then this yeah. happens. Do you think if he hadn't done that, do you think Ben was softening up? Do you think Ben would have, would have taught him what he was fine was waiting so long to learn? No, there's so much we don't know about naming. Uh, now, but I'm not even trying to avoid spoilers. There's so much we don't know about naming mm -hmm. period ever, ever yet so far. Right. And you learn a little bit more, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, like we said before, if it's a belief thing or a you know, wisdom thing, I'm not, I'm not sure what the limitations are. Can a 12 year old learn to name? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'd like to think that that Ben wouldn't have, but it's possible. He he says in this chapter, he says, it's so easy to forget how young you are. I forget. He asks him, how old are you? He's like, I'll be 12 in a few weeks. And he says, God, it's so easy to forget that. Right. You're, you seem so much older. So maybe, maybe you would have. What do you think? Yeah, I like what you're saying. It's hard to it's hard to know because just because we don't know so much about naming yet, but it, it does come back to, you know, if if all of this is kind of about belief, and a child will believe anything, right? A child's in their mind possibilities trust, yeah. are limitless. Yeah, I could just do this, you know. Mm -hmm. 
my son was just talking to me just minutes before we hopped on this podcast as I was tucking him into bed about how he was watching a YouTube video about the best mansions in the world. And there's one in Dallas and it's $20 million. And when he's a famous hockey player, he's going to buy that mansion with his $20 million so that he can have a water park in his backyard. Cause that's, what's in that mansion. And he believes that as a 10 year old. And I'm like, yep, he totally sure. did. Yeah. Go um, for it. But uh, you know, probably part of being able to, name the wind is bearing a certain amount of responsibility and doing that responsibly. And uh, so that's where it's difficult. Not that a 12 year old couldn't learn to name the wind, but, or call the wind, but to do it responsibly is a big deal. We gave my other son a drill for Christmas because he loves tinkering and building things. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the first thing, the first time he used that drill, he almost put it through the meat between his finger and his thumb. Like, (laughs) (laughs) he's fine he's okay he's used it multiple times since then well but you know same thing it's just yeah Yeah. i don't know man uh i I struggle with i struggle with giving giving power tools tools. to children well i don't mean i don't i actually mean power tools or hammers or any kind of tools i mean yeah skills (laughs) tools any sort of tools Uh you know and yet you want them to grow and succeed it's such a hard thing it really is. And oh, so. Quoth seems so, he seems to get it, right? Like he's so smart. And he, ha- I mean, th- this chapter opens uh, talking about, you know, the fact that he's disappointed in sympathy because it doesn't feel like magic. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like real magic. Magic I mean, was to, not what I expected magic to be. I mean, to me, lifting a giant stone with a little stone seems like magic. I'd call seems that great. magic. Seems great. It, I mean, it's like telekinesis, basically. You're creating fire from nothing. Awesome. That's magic. Yeah. What this the hell is, is he this getting is, on about? This is really cool. Uh, I mean, I, I guess like one of them requires energy or, you know, like it's more sciencey maybe, I guess, but it's still pretty magic. But I, I, and so like, I guess he's applying, he's trying to apply that science to the magic in this naming attempt as if they're related somehow, but maybe not. I, I was interested in how, Ben fixed him because what he's done, like you so perfectly described, he's bound his air to the air outside, which means that he can't actually expel the air he has. And even if he could expel it, he couldn't probably have the energy to bring the air in for another breath. Yeah. It says that he would need his, his lungs would need to be bigger than bellows. Yeah. Big iron be bellows. To, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know what, you know, we just talked about belief and, and commanding the wind to do, you know, whatever, whatever he wants, I guess. But it seems like putting more air into Kvoth wouldn't help. Like it would help temporarily. He'd get one breath, but he still couldn't expel it. The binding is still there. So like he could then pull it back out and then put it like he could keep doing it with the wind. Like uh, 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 right? breathe for him, basically. Right. Essentially. But unless he undoes the binding. It feels it feels like that wouldn't have worked. Yeah, I think that's what Ben did. I think he you must think he have undid the binding. Undid the binding, and maybe that was he had to speak to the wind to do that. You know, mm-hmm. and so maybe that's maybe that's what the chronicler did in the end was he had to speak to the iron to right have it so, to break that bond. So it does it does imply a relationship between the sciency sympathy stuff. Mm-hmm. And the magic-y naming stuff. It must. But there's yeah. there's some there's some element unless he just did both independently. Like, okay, here's some breath so you don't die, and now I'm going to undo your binding. Sure, that could but, have been it. Yeah, but but it feels cooler if they're connected somehow. Right, I like your idea better. Hmm. I don't anyway. know. I don't Perhaps. know. Yeah, Beta possessed impeccable moral character. I love that little line. <laughs> little little lines like that just make you smile. Beta, of course, being one of his uh, two, are they mules or donkeys? I don't remember. Yes, mules and donkeys and proof that the Greek exists in the land of Tamarind. Yep, it does. <laughs> uh, we have a nice little bit with Arladin and Lorian again. Uh, yeah, I passed over all goals. the Greystone stuff. Yeah. Um, I, we'll talk about Greystones a little bit in... Maybe after dark, maybe. 
but yeah, there, just some nice moments, but I don't know if it's anything too crucial. Yep. We get that great line about how music touches the heart directly, yes. no matter how small or stubborn the mind of the man who listens. And this is the type of stuff you were talking to me about when you're like, I think you'd really like these books, Matt. I remember yeah. you bringing that stuff up. That, well, what was that? A hundred pages to get you one line that you liked. <laughs> I'd like more lines than that. <laughs> that one definitely struck a chord with me. Yeah, our, Music our struck a chord. Oh, there we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Arledon's not much of a fan of poets uh, without, you know, without the music. Right. Um, and Lorian plays them a little bit. And that's, okay. that is the power of music, man. It, it bypasses, you can listen to it very academically and I enjoy doing that, mm-hmm. but it can also just like, just go straight to grab your heart it. and grab it. And then yeah. it often grabs other people the same way too. And that's why live music is so fun. Uh, Cause it's just a bunch of people having their hearts grabbed at the same time. Yeah. Uh, it's Awesome. You match Anyways. box 20 fan map because Matt Nathanson's opening for him locally. Yes, he is. They're coming to you sauna together. Yeah. But, um, Lily and I talked about going. Oh, Lily, I said my daughter's name on the podcast. Oh, said, no. oh, we'll do. Look at me go. Leia. 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 I'll edit that out. Uh she we talked about going to that one, but I think we're gonna go to um counting crows and dashboard confessional instead. <laughs> yeah long december but there's reason to believe yes that maybe this year will be better than the last yeah uh this is kind of going back a little bit i suppose the the power in kids hands but i really was struck with thoughtless versus stupid (laughs) and i'm definitely going to use that right yeah it's definitely a thing and it totally resonates when you read it (laughs) oh yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> Especially if you have kids, you're like, you're not stupid. I know you're not, not. stupid you at all. Thinking you were correct. You weren't correct. applying the wisdom and knowledge that you have to this situation. It was, you know, you weren't careful. I, I think careful is the way I usually put it, but mm-hmm. I think thoughtless is, is one I'll have to start using. It sounds a little meaner than careless. Anyway. Yeah, there's probably, but it's not as mean as stupid. So No, that's true. I've never... <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've ever called my kids stupid. No, no. I would, maybe if they were, but they aren't. Lucky, lucky them. Uh, yeah. A clever, thoughtless person. It's one of the most terrifying things there is. Yes. So yeah, that's that'd be careless because you're still clever. You're smart, but you're not thinking about the consequences of your actions. Yeah. yeah. Thoughtless. Mm-hmm. Uh, wisdom to use power appropriately, and both is missing that wisdom, but he has tremendous power. And it's kind of interesting. I I don't know whether this is like. I mean, I I hate to say, I hate to accuse authors of making mistakes, but the turnaround between, you know, this idea that things are going to go back to normal between he and Ben, and distractions and farewells which is the next chapter where they say goodbye to ben there's no time for the or very little time for the change in avanthi to take place about being more careful with what he teaches them right they talk a little bit about it but um it says lessons ground to near a standstill he altered my fledgling study of alchemy limiting limiting me to chemistry instead no more sigilry and rationing the sympathy So like, I don't know how long it was, but it immediately goes to the next chapter to saying goodbye. Like, yeah, he doesn't get any any chance to kind of like make it up to him. Yeah. Which is heartbreaking. Yeah. Should we get to the heartbreak? Do you have more for this chapter? I do not. No. Distractions and farewells. Let's get to the heartbreak. Bring him in the heartbreak. That's a, I missed the tune entirely. That's a Def Leppard song. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's a good one. Wow. You're not a you're not a Def Leppard guy, are you? I, I like Def Leppard. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm limited. Limited. Yeah. I actually like a lot of their newer stuff. I think we might have talked about this. Yeah, they're they're yeah, like newer, like a decade old. 
mean? It's still pretty old now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at this point. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, they came out with an album. It was kind of their big yeah, comeback album in the late '90s, I think. The album's called Euphoria, and it is a complete banger. It's got a song yeah. called Promises on it uh-huh. that just rules. I, so I, I think I like the one we have talked about this before, but we can do it again. Uh, the one I like is Slang, which I think is before Euphoria, and it's oh, got it? a song. Maybe it's out. Uh, I don't know. It's got a song called uh, Breathe a Sigh on it, which I just love. Yeah, it's one of my favorite songs. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, some of their they... later stuff was good. Like they didn't stop. They just kind of kept trying to grow and try new stuff. Some of that stuff from Euphoria and later sounds really like almost boy bandish, right? It's like, what are you guys doing? It's like, all right, okay. It it is like, I mean, all that stuff from the later albums. It does sound very similar. Yeah. Um, it's just like another album of power ballads. Yeah. yeah, slang was from '96. Euphoria is from '99. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to check that one out. I like the one after Euphoria too. Ten. It's just an X. Mm. That one's got. Oh some yeah, good yeah. Stuff. I remember ten. But yeah. they're all pretty formulaic. A little bit after that point. Yeah. But it's a good formula. Like when you're in the right mood for it, it feels feels nice. There's gonna be guitar solos. There's gonna be yeah. harmonies. Um, yeah, it, every song's about love. Yes, most of them. Yeah, it's gonna just uh, be, and it's gonna be nice. <laughs> Breathe sigh is is a good one on slang. Uh, there's one called Blood Runs Cold. I think that's pretty good. Anyway, yeah, give it a listen. It's a good one. And if you can't find it, I can loan it to you. I still have it on the old. Um, it's old technology now. It's called a CD. Oh yeah, Scad. There's this thing called Spotify where you can find almost all the songs. I don't. I don't know what that is. I'm looking at it right now. I need, I need glasses these days. Def have, I, have I made the, the Viv years? Too old to see jokes recently. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that are joining us for uh, our coverage of the name of the wind and have not followed us in our previous podcast journeys, we do this a lot. Yeah, Get used happens. to it. This happens. The, the side journeys are a lot of the fun so just almost as good as the real journeys so stop shaking your head yeah there's stop. Def leopard for and this just, evening yeah just enjoy it just realize that you just got introduced to slang a kick-ass album after Def leopard was popular and several albums after and you got a whole new world of music to listen to yeah just go pop on and on spoffify spoff <laughs> spoff spiffy spiffy spoof of spoofity spoofity yep. all right uh, chapter 15, distraction, di- Distractions and Farewells. The troop had stopped in Hallowfell to get a few of their wagons fixed up, but what they didn't count on was one of their number getting hitched up. So a little wagon metaphor. Amethy met a youngish widowed brewer with a son that needed schooling and a brewer that needed some help. Hook, line, and sinker for a brewer like Amethy. But first, a party to celebrate. They moved Quoth's birthday up a couple weeks to be a combo birthday going away party. And let me tell you, these people know how to throw one. When everyone has seen your tricks, you try out the new stuff. You perform your best and riskiest stuff in moments like this one. Music and drums and dancing, yes, but also there was a mock sword fight at this party, fire breathing, the best beer is brought out for Shirzies. Some highlights for young Quoth, a sweeping dance with his mother brought him joy and comfort amidst the loss of, of losing Ben, which is going to be a huge thing for him. Uh, his parents performing a duet on one of Ilian's greatest works. Ilian is kind of like the god of the Edema Rue. He's their kind of most famous member. Uh, I prefer lay- Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, <laughs> yes. Uh, a duet of one of Bob's greatest works, The Lay of Sir Savian Tralliard. And gifts. He got a lovely cloak with lots of pockets. He got a pocket knife. Uh, and he got a new loot from his parents. And then as things were kind of in a little lull, there started a chant. Lonre, 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 McCall. Rufio, Rufio, yes. Rufio. You went hook, I went braveheart. It's fine. Uh, the troops started chanting it, the whole troop. Arladin never plays a song before it's done. And he put up a fight here, a good fight. He had put his loot away, he declined for minutes at a time, but eventually he gave in despite you know, this normal rule of never sharing anything until it's done. And he doesn't share all of it. And I don't have a tune, 
Although, we, Matt, you should write one. No pressure. We've talked about this. We're yeah. Trying to put all these songs to put songs. all these songs to music. Mm-hmm. I'll just read the text because it's important, Love but it. I won't sing it because I don't have a tune. Uh, and it would be off tune if I had one. Uh, sit and listen all, for I will sing a story wrought and forgotten in a time old and gone. A story of a man. Proud Lonray, strong as the spring, steel of the sword he had ready at hand. Hear how he fought, fell, and rose again, to fall again. Under shadow falling then, love felled him, love for native land and love of his wife Lyra, at whose calling some say he rose through doors of death to speak her name as his first reborn breath. And then, of course, not close to all he has written, but he stopped there with a wicked smile, put his loot away, teasing the whole troop. Mm, make them beg for <clears throat> more. Yeah, they screamed a bit, but they all felt lucky for having gotten what they'd had. Uh, so the music continued, dance continued, the night continued on, and uh, and the, the joy, you know, the joy continued as well. Both parents danced together, eyes closed, her head on his chest, swaying to the music, and it gave Quoth a picture he still maintains uh, in his head of what love is to him. And then it was finally time to go as the sun was rising. Awkward and inadequate words mixed with a big hug and Quoth smoothing out Ben's eyebrows and catching him by surprise highlighted the farewell between the two of them. And Ben's departure left in Quoth a dull, bittersweet ache, but also a book. When Quoth awoke, there was a gift for him from Ben. Rhetoric and logic, a book from Ben's library that Quoth absolutely loathed. And here's an inscription from Ben. Quoth. Defend yourself well at university. Make me proud. Remember your father's song. Be wary of folly. Your friend, Aventhe. The university. A dream of Coth's, but also terrifying. To leave the troop, to stop performing, to stay in the same place for months at a time. It's not what the Adimaru do, man. Both read the inscription again, cried a bit, and promised to do his best. And that's the end of the chapter. Wow. It's party, Matt. That chapter. It's a good it's party, party, though. Yeah. There's even a lap dance you failed to mention. I did. I did skip the lap dance. Yeah. Uh, Sadly, Shandy. Rothfuss did too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We didn't get. Uh, we didn't get any of George's. Uh, you know, boob escapades in this one. <laughs> yeah. They they sure know how to how to throw one. They call this uh this widow with the with the brewery a snare for Ben. Yeah, and we've talked about that life already. Uh, but I think the trooper's life, at least at a young age, that would have been my snare. So I just run around performing with great friends all the time. This sounds amazing. Sign me yeah. up. Yeah, I am I, snared. M- yeah, my hip wouldn't tolerate it now, but man, it sounds great. Did, would what do you have? In your like early twenties, do you have like a a life snare that you think you could have fallen into, or or did you fall into it? Maybe you fell, maybe you fell into it. You know, I don't think I would have admitted it at that age, but I fell into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. The quiet life always appealed to me. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was, caused a lot of dissonance too because I loved music so much yeah, and yeah. really wanted to pursue that. And then as I grew up, I found out that the values that I had in terms of wanting to be a father and have a family and everything didn't jive incredibly well with at least my vision of it. There's lots of people that make it work just fine and do a wonderful job of it. But the way that I wanted it to be didn't jive well with someone who's on the road all the time and things like that. So journey's got a great song about that. And when we saw Matt Nathanson, he talked a fair bit about uh, his daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how they make it how work. They, right, how they make it work. But it, it does sound certainly like it's challenge, challenging. But yeah. So I didn't know if that snare was just as something that Kvoth envisioned it for Ben, or mm. like he saw it as a snare, mm. or if there was actually something to it. Like if there are forces combining trying oh. to get Kvoth or Ben out of Kvoth's life. Uh, we have no evidence that anyone's keeping an eye on quoth or anything you know what yeah, i mean I, yeah i didn't think about that at all uh i just but thought this, of it as kind of like a clever you know a fun a way, way of saying patrick yeah. to talk about it but it could be 
but it's a widow, fairly mm-hmm. wealthy, fairly young, fairly attractive, goes after this old bushy eyebrowed wanderer, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Who's pushing 60. Yeah. 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 It's a, a reasonable, it's not point. unheard of, not yeah. unheard of, but who would, um, uh, do you have a, do you have a, any sort of musing about who might be doing it? No. Okay. I mean, the logical answer to anything bad is just the Chandrian, but we have yeah. no indication we'll see in the next chapter that they even, I mean, if they would have known who he was in yeah. the next chapter, they probably wouldn't have left him. So. Yeah. Right. In their eyes, he was just a kid. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I suppose it could have been not about Quoth. Yeah. It could have been about, you know, they heard, they overheard somehow the conversation mm. and Abanthi was giving information about it. Less and about Quoth. So yeah. One of their members put on a glamour or something and lured him away. Right. Into this life to, to kill him quietly or whatever. And or he could have never been heard a, from again. A, he could have been a danger to, like he could have been the one roadblock in the way of them coming and killing off this troop. Oh yeah. Um, he's actually, yeah, he's a threat. So then, yeah. so get him out of there. Yeah. it's a good point. I never thought of that. That's I didn't until right now. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. We I do know. know there are male and female members of the Chandrian. Um, and certainly a male probably could put on a glamour anyway, um, depending on you know the rules and such that we don't really know super well about this world yet. But uh, that's an interesting thought. I never, I never thought of it as, as anything more than, you know, this guy's getting up there in years and he can't do this forever. And, oh my gosh, look what fell in my lap. It you could know. have been that. We shouldn't discount that. But I, your idea is more fun. We should, we should just wish nothing but good for Ben. Yeah, I want, yeah, I want Ben to just be a quiet brewer. And he's his, found that, and yeah, into his mid eighties. Yep. Before leaving her a widow again. Yep. To trap someone else. It's really sad that that's not the first thing that my mind will just <laughs> let believe. It's like, I'm, here, I'm just talking about how, you know, that's what I wanted in yes. life was the simple right. family life exactly. and everything. And I'm yeah. like, oh, this guy finds it. I'm like, bull crap. No, nope. no, no way. That's real. Nope. Nope. <laughs> uh, I don't know, you know, certainly that life is not as easy on a 60-year-old as it is on a 12-year-old, uh, the trooper life, but yeah, that'd be, I'm not sure there, I, I, I'm not sure there's a life that could get me to walk away from that. I mean, that sounds yeah. great to me. Right. But, um, you know, I mean, because you you can have, you can have, you know, Arlidan and Laurie. You get to have proof. your cake you can and have eat the it family. too. Yeah. 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 You can have, Just take and it's, with it's you. a community family too, right? And it's, Anyway, that, that's part of the Adimaru culture as well. So it's all very normal to them, right? Yeah, that's a lot of fun. feels different. but I mean, even our podcast, we're kind of, you know, what kind of sets us up is is that sense of community and that we've tried to establish. And it's like our own little Adimaru. Very much. But, very much. So, yeah. I've had, I've had dreams about like, you know, communes with our with all with our little family right and bringing all of our families together and, hey dude the davos and, uh, fingers meet and greet yeah it'd be fun we talked about on our uh get together the other night yes yes mm-hmm. uh sus mapas i haven't said that too much but we finally get the map sucks but we finally get a thing that's useful yeah halifel puts them on the left side of the map in the Commonwealth, nowhere close to where I originally thought they were. I don't know why, but I kind of assumed they were near Annalyn, kind of in near the middle of the map. And they're not. They're way over on the left side of it there. Uh, so that's the first useful thing the map has really done for us. So good. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot, Pat. Yeah. I mean... If you're listening, Pat, we need a better map. We're going to say it like every episode. Come on, dude. (laughs) But the guy can write lines like this. And this just grabbed my heart. At some point in the night, you touched on your summary. At some point in the night, my mother swept me up and danced around in a great spinning circle. Her laughter sang out like music trailing in the wind. 
Her hair and skirt spun around me as she twirled. She smelled comforting the way only mothers do. That smell and the quick laughing kiss she gave me did more to ease the dull ache of Ben's leaving than all the entertainments combined. I mean, come it's, on. It's beautiful. I mean, come the yeah. F on. Yeah. And you get one later about his parents dancing together, going mm-hmm. back to their relationship stuff. Mm-hmm. My parents danced together, her head on his chest. Both had their eyes closed. They seemed so perfectly content. If you can find someone like that, someone you can hold and close your eyes to the world with, then you're lucky, even if it only lasts for a minute or a day. To close your eyes to the world with. Forget mm-hmm. it's out there. Just, yeah. Just dwell on each other. Ugh, man. Matt, have you ever had a good goodbye? I'm not great at goodbyes. I don't think anyone is. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I've ever had a good, good, like, you know, see you laters, you know, where I know I'm going to see somebody again soon. Sure. But like, but like goodbyes where we know it's impactful it's and it. be a bit, yeah. or maybe the last time. Looking someone in the eye, telling them what they mean to you, like getting it all out there. Yeah, Terrible like at it. Never. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever had a good one. Terrible at it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? It's like, do you just stare at them, like look them in the eye and make sure they're getting it? Or is that, you know, it's bad. I, 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 I read this goodbye with him and Abenthi and yeah, it sounds awkward, but it's sweet. And it's I think, really you know, sweet. It's good really enough. Sweet. Good yeah. enough. Sometimes all you can do is that hug. Yeah. The, the what's not said. Sometimes there's a lot in what's not being said. You kind of just feel it. And yep. There it goes. Yes. I remember. Send him an email later. When I was, uh, I had a, a friend in the back seat of the car I was in when I said goodbye to my, my best friend in high school. And we've seen each other, you know, you know, 10 times maybe since then over the last 20, whatever years it's been since we said goodbye that summer. But our friend Lonnie, she was a good friend of both of ours. And we didn't even get out of the car. We were just like, bye, man. Just see see you later. You know, like it was very terrible. And she's like, just get out. Like after he'd left, she's like, what do you just get out and go give him a hug or something? I'm like, I, I think I said, that's not the way we do things. There's some, <laughs> something just terrible. Uh and then I said goodbye to her later, uh, like 15 minutes later when I dropped her off. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's uh goodbyes suck. Or sometimes they can be really awesome. You got one? I want to hear it. Oh, I was talking about you and Lonnie. <laughs> oh no, we were I mean, we were just friends. Okay. And we've seen we and we saw each other. Well, that's what I was getting. <laughs> Just the way you said it, man. Listeners, tell me if you thought the same thing when Scat just goes, and then I said goodbye to her 15 minutes later. <laughs> it's like the way you said it, I was like, oh. If I was going to tell that story in that way, I would have said more than 15 minutes. I'd have given myself a little more credit. <laughs> no, no. Was, Is that uh, on Greece? It's 15 minutes. Is that all you need? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's way more than enough. Tell us, Kalisar, if you thought the same thing I did when Sked said that. <laughs> a love, a lovely woman, Lonnie. Still, uh, sorry, don't Lonnie. talk to her much, but a good person. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I, yep, yep. Okay. On that note, uh, in my opinion, anyone who isn't moved by it is less than human inside. He talks mm. about songs. Mm-hmm. You have a song that you think that like if you guys don't like this song, there's something wrong with you. Like if you... I've got a bunch, but Oof. uh Desperado. Desperado. I don't know. No, I mean I would even count that, I wouldn't even count that as one of my favorite songs. Uh just trying to think something that like tugs at your heartstrings that way. I get that if you're just like you are not even human if that doesn't make you feel something father and son if you're a man oh yeah yeah 
and Cat Stevens. Right. Uh, that's if for those Marvel fans out there that they play that at the end of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite songs for sure. Uh, what about, what do you got? Uh, also obvious, sounds like you're fully loaded. Oh my gosh, Forty One by Dave Matthews Band. That's uh-huh. the greatest song ever written on this planet. Um, tonight, tonight by the Smashing Pumpkins. That's a popular one. But if that song doesn't make you feel like there's something, you are a zombie. You are on The Last of Us. Like there's, yeah, there's just, yeah, there's, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, it's a few by Counting Crows that are that way. I love listening to you talk about music. Oh, I could talk about it all day. I know you could. Yeah. We should probably move on before I do. I think I feel that way more about, you know, I I, I think I'm just more visual. I, I feel that way more about scenes. You know, mm-hmm. you brought up The In Last film? of Us. Yeah. There's there's an episode from The Last of Us. Well, episode three was it this year. Yeah. Um, and just moving. Uh, just seeing human interaction like that. And I think I have more, more things like that. Uh, yeah, for sure. There, there's a, my favorite love scene uh, in is in meet Joe black. Um, and I, every time I watch it, I'm just like, I'm blown away by it. There's just something just... unique and special about it. Right. Um, but yeah, music, I, I think, I think less. Yeah. It's hard for me to come up with examples. I came up with one. We'll leave it at that, I guess. Yep. I'm gonna I'm have to give tonight tonight another another shot. I like the song. I always like today better. I, I mean, wherever you're at in <laughs> its 24 hour period, it's fine. <laughs> it's as long as the Smashing Pumpkins are included or involved. Yeah. But okay. All right. I think we've talked about on the podcast before. I think a lot of it goes into uh, the stories I've heard about that song. You know. Mm. And we've talked yeah. Billy Corgan being such a taskmaster and mm-hmm. forcing the drummer to replay the song over and over again to the point that his hands were bleeding and stuff. I think that just adds to it for me. There's songs just dripping with passion for me. So and blood. Yeah. Dripping. <laughs> dripping. dripping. Blood. Physically and figuratively. Mm-hmm. It's just a gorgeous song. We believe in the resolute urgency of now, he says in the song. So that song just makes me go. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good. Well, some outrageous stuff, it, it, like in a different way. That right? makes Not you feel. Felt. Yeah, yeah. It makes yeah. you like just fucking. It doesn't have to be a heartfelt feel. It can just be like, yeah, yeah, I want to go m- raise your fist and march around. Is that's the line of a song? So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Ah. Uh, oh man, should we? Should we go there, Scott? Move on. Oh boy. On, move on to hope. A oh boy. One, wonderfully named chapter. What a yeah, it's it's a name for sure. Speaking of getting kicked in the balls. You called it hope, Patrick. Well done. Well freaking done. Ben's departure from the troop left a gaping hole in Quoth's heart as well as his day to day. Uh, And his parents tried to fill that with lessons from both themselves and their fellow troopers. Japing, tumbling, dancing, swordplay, acting, etiquette. Aside from the latter, all of it sounds amazing. One day, however, a large felled tree was found to be blocking their road, precipitating a pause for the evening as they cleared the tree. Quoth was sent on an errand by his parents to gather sage for really no other reason than that they wanted to bang one out in a little bit of privacy. Uh, which I love for them. That's so good. So off he went into the woods, happy to have some privacy of his own. Those hours in the woods, as it says, were the last carefree hours of his life, the last moments of his childhood. As Quoth returns to camp that evening, Rothfuss does not waste time in revealing the carnage. There, Tripp's tent burning. There, Taryn's body lying broken. There, Shandy's body lying beside a kettle of cooking potatoes, tents and wagons burning everywhere, all the flames tinged with blue. Recognizing he was in shock, Quoth called upon all the training Ben had given him to stay centered. And he heard voices, several voices, sitting around a fire, his parents' fire. He was startled as he leaned against a wagon wheel and it essentially crumbled under his touch, and it caught the attention of the figures. 
One rose gracefully to his feet, eyes intent on Quoth, who described him thus. I remember him as clearly as I remember my own mother, sometimes better. His face was narrow and sharp with the perfect beauty of porcelain. His hair was shoulder length, framing his face in loose curls the colors of frost. He was a creature of winter's pale. Everything about him was cold and sharp and white, except his eyes. They were black, like a goat's, but with no iris. His eyes were like his sword, and neither one reflected the light of the fire or the setting sun. And then the figure smiled at him. Quoth, Quoth felt as if it was the first time in his life that he had ever been truly afraid. The man, who his colleagues referred to as Cinder, attempted to converse with Quoth, but Quoth was rendered speechless, frozen like a fawn. Cinder then began to gently mock Quoth, drawing out of him that the fire around which he and his colleagues were gathered was indeed his parents' fire. Someone's parents, Cinder said, have been singing entirely the wrong sort of songs. Cinder was then ch chastised by another figure, apart from the rest, cloaked completely in black, in a black oily shadow that neither fire nor sunset could penetrate. The figure ordered Cinder to send Quoth to the soft and painless blanket of his sleep, to which Cinder initially blanched. But the figure, who Cinder refers to as Haliax, reminds him of the nature of their relationship. Cinder is but a tool in Haliax's hand, nothing more. When Cinder attempts mild defiance, a spoken word from Haliax sends him doubled over in pain until he acknowledges his subservience to his shadowed lord. Haliax knows the inner turnings of Cinder's name, he says. He keeps him safe from those that would harm Cinder, and it's his purpose that Cinder serves none other. That seems very clear to the reader. Haliax continues, spreading his calm ire to the group as a whole, chastising them for losing sight of their true purpose, what they all wish to achieve. And then he suddenly stops. They come, he warns, calling his colleagues to himself. He spreads his arms, and with it the shadow surrounding him bloomed like a flower unfolding. They all stepped into the shadow and were gone. Quoth was alone. He checked every body he found for signs of life. He found his parents. He found their wagon. Everything inside was the same as it had always been. And then that familiarity, Quoth lit every candle inside and fell asleep on his mother's pillow, clutching his father's lute. He was awoken by the smoke of the candles which had caught fire to everything in the wagon. And gathering a few things, including Ben's book and his father's lute, Quoth escapes the blaze and begins walking. As dawn approaches, he sits and begins to play his father's lute. He played until his fingers bled on the strings, until the sun shone through the trees, until his arms ached, trying not to remember, until he fell asleep. Oh. That one rips you to pieces. And yet you can't afford to be ripped to pieces because there's so much in here that you have to pay attention to. Right. It's like, my heart is on the ground, Pat. I can't be counting the Chandrian right now. Yeah, yeah. Did he say men and women? Oh, did we have? Yeah. Uh, wood Halli what? breaking. What? Shadow facts. Blue fires. Oh. What? Halifax, shadow facts. Ooh, what? <laughs> Where? Are we, what are we talking about? Nova Scotia, what? And all I can come back to is the King's Road is not on the damn map. Of course it's not. Why would it be? They're on something called the King's Road, and it's not on the map. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Let's you focus won't, on them. But we'll talk about something else for now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you think well, that you, tree was placed there to get them to stop? Or was that yeah, coincidence? I imagine so. Yeah. I imagine it was. They they make a point of saying, you know, they're talking about when the storm was. It was it's like two 16, weeks ago or something. Yeah. 16 days ago, two span. A span is 11 days. Arlidan says two span, quote, corrects him and says 16, another indication of his memory and general perfection, quotes, <laughs> uh, implying that, you know, if if the storm had knocked it down, somebody would have come by and cleared it by now. Somebody's on this King's Road more often than that. Um, you know, so it's been felled by something else purposefully, you know. So, yeah, I think very much they they put it down to stop them and 
and corral them. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> we, we, I, we used to say this about George a lot uh, from the song Ice and Fire, that he has this ability to just take you down a path and then like with a single sentence, just flip the entire scene on its head. Yeah. And uh, the line is, I hope they spent those last few hours well. That line just, yeah. It's crushing. Mm -hmm. It's crushing. And you just know you're, you're now in for a ride. And what a, what a wonderfully well phrased, simple sentence. And at the same time, he, he it, it gives so much lead up to it. There's very little spoiler in what's happening. He gives plenty of warning, right? Yeah. Things are going to get bad. This was the last yes. moments of my childhood. It's all these phrases over the last this couple chapters. This is how chapters. I like to remember them. Right. You know, as people are not like all of this is going to happen. And we just, we get these beautiful moments with his family, right? With his mother and his father. Mm -hmm. But then Rothfuss allows Quoth to be in shock and allows him to live in that shock filled world to the point that we don't get any emotional payoff of him finding his parents. It's hardly yeah. mentioned. They yeah. talk, he talks more about what's his name's body, Taryn's body mm -hmm. than he does about his parents. It just, yeah. it's like a one line. Yep. I found my parents. Yeah. And the scene, right. Attempt, yep. attempt to digging, you know, mm -hmm. the grave or something, but you imagine this scene of him, you get more with Shandy than you do with, with yeah. his parents you get of more with Shandy's damn potatoes. Yeah. He finishes cooking the potatoes. It's his coping mechanism. Right. Yep. Um, you'd, you'd imagine him like crying over their bodies or something, yeah. but instead Patrick allows him to live in that shock and yeah. gloss over it completely. Yeah. And and then obviously he does have, you know, that nice moment in the wagon and everything, yes. but right. The but even actual that, moment even of finding moment them is still pretty. It's just like, he's just going through some motions and mm -hmm. cuddling in and not, he's not processing it really almost right. It's still fatigue. He falls asleep. It's fatigue and shock still, but you can, you can also throughout all of that, you can just see this. If you, mm -hmm. if you like close your yeah. eyes, you can just, you can imagine the smoke. You can imagine the, the, the tent that's like catching fire, but not, not a flame really, because it's been treated. You can, you can imagine the boiling potatoes. You can, the, the wheel mm -hmm. that's stuck in another person's fire. You can, you can see all this stuff so clearly with the language he uses. Mm -hmm. I'm not always great at that. Like, I'm not always great at the description stuff. I'm like putting myself in the scene, but this, this is so well done. It just Agreed. puts you right in there mm -hmm. with Quoth. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Yep. So we talked about some signs of the Chandrian earlier when they were talking about the sign, the song. We get several of them in in this description. Yeah. Oh, Many that validate what they were what talking they about. Just talked about rusted mm -hmm. wheel, blue flame, rotten wood that crumbles in his hand. Uh, eyes like a goat with cinder, uh, shadow pooled around uh, Haliax. Um, you know, so a lot of those things ex exactly mentioned in the previous chapter when they were talking about it. Um, so if you really need to be beaten over the head with it, these are the Chandrian and these are their signs. Right. Although it does only mention several, not seven. Yes. Uh, it does specify, like you said earlier, men and women, though. Yeah. And speaks maybe to Lorian's point uh, about the fact that maybe they don't always come up, you know, all together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. Um, this relationship between Haliax and Cinder, they are not a team. This is Correct. not the Avengers or right. the Dark Avengers. or Which you kind of imagine the Trandrian being. And this yeah, is very different. Yeah. I mean, they have the same, what are they, purpose, I think is the word they use. They have the same purpose, but it almost sounds like it's Haliax's purpose. They're one guy calling the shots, yeah. And they're just, like he calls them tools in his hand, as you said in your summary. 
Um, which begs the question, what's in it for them? Right. You know, what um, power does he hold that, you know, say there's seven yeah. that six couldn't overpower the one. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it says he protects them from uh, the Ammer, the Sith, and the Singers. But he says, yeah. Um, so he offers them protection, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know what kind of, you know, is it just the cloaking mechanism that he has with the darkness that, that protects them? Or does he have some other powers that they don't have? Um, perhaps they feel like if they rose up and overpowered him, they wouldn't have anywhere to hide. <clears throat> and that he he's the only thing that provides that cloak. Yeah. Yeah. He does use, Haliax uses naming control sender. Barula apparently is at least the text version that we get for his name. Right. Um, And that does track with, uh, we get in book two, we get um, both as visiting, you know, some other people. We get, you know, some, some information about their names and that tracks. I don't think that's a huge spoiler, but um, you know that uh that's his name and again kind of like the what can you do with his name feels like he could do anything could he have just said iron and bound him with iron i don't know but he said his name and it feels like maybe he could have made him do anything yeah which is crazy yeah yeah and maybe that's what (laughs) makes him so powerful yeah powerful and bad but also not as cruel as cinder you know uh he talks about them being too a... too fond of their little cruelties yeah so he's more calculating perhaps not yeah he's not easily swayed by his purpose uh, or from it yeah yeah not swayed from the purpose swayed yeah. from it yeah mm-hmm. yeah there's uh in D there's like alignment charts right there's like um you know, uh, lawful evil, which is always kind of a, there's lawful evil, neutral evil, and chaotic evil. And chaotic evil is a lot of fun. It's just like, I'm going to wreck shit, right? But lawful evil is like, you have this set of rules that you follow, that you believe in your own, it's not the actual law, it's not the world's laws, it's your own law that you follow, your own code of ethics, your own, you know, goals that you're trying to accomplish, and you stick to that, and you don't deviate from it. And that's kind of what this is, right? It feels like he has a purpose. He's locked onto it, you know, and seems like he has been for a long time. And he uses these guys to accomplish it. Right. And that purpose, I don't know, the implication that I'm picking, that I'm seeing is, uh, or the inference that I'm making is uh, survival. Their survival? Yeah. Survival through hiding or through... Yeah, um, this they're being talked about too much. So they go to the source and they wipe out that source that's talking about them. Yeah, And then all of a sudden, oop, something's on our tail. Something's coming to get us. We're not yeah. going to stand and fight it, even though maybe right. that it's powerful. But I don't know. They just wiped out this whole troop of people. Yeah. Um, so we're going to run. Yeah. Yeah, we can get more into their purpose in in Devi After Dark for sure, but I agree with you. The first the first part of it feels like live, you know, like stop spreading our name around so that we get caught. And as soon as we do that, let's you know we're not going to celebrate forever. Let's let's get out of here and make sure we're not caught. Mm-hmm. Live to fight another day. Yep. Yep. Both man, I'm parched. <laughs> then I played. So he gets his dad's loot, not the one he was just given. Not the one he was just given on his birthday. And he just goes into the forest and plays until his fingers bleed. My fingers hurt, but I played anyway. Oh, maybe not bleed, just hurt. Well, he does bleed. It talks about how his blood coated the strings oh, and okay. everything. But uh, yeah, the sentence that I pulled at least was my fingers hurt, but I played anyway. Yeah. Finding some sort of numbing the pain, I guess, maybe with the music. 
Correct. Yeah. The, the pain in his heart, I guess you could say, not to sound too corny, uh, needed salving more than the pain in his fingers, right? Mm-hmm. 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 What else do you have for this chapter? I mean, there's the whole bit before the Chandrian come. <laughs> Great stuff from his mom. Yes. Gives us the chance for something hot. Yes. To eat. Yes. To eat. <laughs> it gets frustrating making do with whatever you can uh, grab at the end of the, the, end day. Of the day. A body once more. <laughs> I love it. I mean, whatever. I'll throw it out there. I'm a sucker for just forward direct women. It's awesome. Yep. Like, uh, I, mean, I, guess, I guess she's still hiding behind the language a little bit, but it's clear. Yep. It's like both get the heck out of here right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he plays along with what is the line? He's like, I'm not sure that grows around here. It might take me some time. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, that's but fine. Totally, totally playing into it. And, and he's he like, and if I on. come back and I don't have any sage, no big deal. And if I come back and they haven't prepared dinner yet, you know, it's no big deal either. No big deal for that either. <laughs> We, we're all we're all doing our things. <laughs> it's nice. Uh, and then, okay. of course, it's very symbolic that that next morning, actually, it being his fault that the rest of his whole life is burned away. His his past, everything that he'd grown yeah. up with, mm-hmm. is burned to the ground. Yeah, and he In escapes with literally what he can carry. Right? Yes. Yeah, which, you know, he's clearly, you know, you want to shake him and be like, get whatever money you can find at least, or like something. Yeah, it's it's grief, you know? Yep, yep. On that, do you want to get to our last uh, chapter? It feels like there should be more to talk about there, but I'm sure there will be in Debbie After Dark. There's a lot of Um, Debbie After Dark for sure. I want to ask you one question real quick. He talks about all of his fill-in teachers. And uh, mm, and my mm-hmm. the note I took was sure beats Mrs. Wadium. Did you have Mrs. Wadium? Mrs. Wadium? Apparently not. I feel like everyone my age in our valley had Mrs. Wadium as a substitute teacher. If you can say stadium and you can say radium, then you can say Wadium. I missed she, her, man. I feel like I would remember that. She thought her name was so hard to say. And she and would do like, that every yeah. time. I mean, I had like, her a yeah, dozen we got times. It. We yeah, got it. It's like, this is not our, uh, I feel like everyone my age knows, knows that. I wonder. Well, if I'm not your age, Scad. You're five years, six, five, six, five. It's five. I'm 38 years old. Yeah, five and a half. Uh, all right. Yeah. Let's move on. All right. My, my Miss Wadium, uh, curiosity sated. Sated. <laughs> uh, we have an interlude chapter entitled Autumn. Bast is brimming with pity for Quoth, but Quoth cuts him off before too much sympathy could be offered. Uh, sympathy, the feeling, not the magic. I appreciate your concern, but this is just a piece of the story and not even the worst piece, he assures his student. Time is a great healer, and so on, he declares. He then exits to gather more firewood admonishing Bast and Chronicler to pull themselves together before he returns. Get over it. Bast and Chronicler then share a nice moment where the two reconcile, agreeing to start over, as it were. And the scene cuts to Quoth, making his way dutifully to the woodpile. And there, with no one to see, he weeps. End of interlude. Yeah. Pull yourself together, man. But not me. Is it? Do, do they? Do they talk about time? Time being a great time is a great healer. Time is a great healer, and so on, and so on. <laughs> Almost as if he doesn't quite believe it himself. And I don't believe it. Mm-hmm. I I think you know. Uh, I guess I get my my therapy through TV, but uh, you know, one of the phrases you hear a lot these days is you know people talk about the work. You know, you have to put in the work to get better at things, to to improve. 
Yeah. And I don't, I don't think time heals anything. I think, you know, it, time can help you forget some things temporarily. Right. But you don't really heal until like you, you work on it. Right. And become kind of okay with it. Right. Hmm. You agree with that or no? I do. Yeah. It's interesting though, because I do, I do, you know, as someone who has had to, uh, uh, seek out coaching as it were to help me, (laughs) uh, arm me with tools for, for coping and dealing with things. Um, I believe that there is work that needs to be put into it and there's a choice that has to be made as well. Um, Mm -hmm. interestingly enough though, just today I'm eating my lunch. Often when I'm eating my lunch, I'll flip on some YouTube for 20 minutes and I just kind of watch whatever I look at a video that looks interesting to me. Um, do you know the comedian Theo Vaughn? You ever no. heard of him? He's a strange one. But <laughs> An odd duck. He's one of those that the onstage persona is very different from that. He has a podcast where he's very thoughtful and articulate and everything. And he did uh, an interview with Louis CK. Mm. Uh, you know, who has had his issues lately. His downs, um, very few yes. ups lately. Big time, big time. But he he was he was interviewing Louis, and Louis was very thoughtful in this interview. I was struck by how thoughtful he was. I feel like he and always he was, is. <clears throat> he oh. is, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was t- they were talking about their fathers, and he was talking about how his relationship with his father was not very good. He implied abuse and all sorts of awful things and didn't have a relationship with him for years until they saw him. He and his sisters saw their father at his mother's funeral. His parents had divorced, but his father came to the funeral. And he said, this man that I had loathed for so long, but was also very afraid of was now this emaciated, pathetic figure who came in could barely walk on his leaning on his cane and everything had difficulty speaking. And he said, somehow all the anger that I felt, everything that I'd been holding on to kind of just melted away. Hmm. And he said, it just, it was gone. And he goes, I still acknowledge the things he did to me and that they weren't cool. But now my heart is full of pity for this man. And he goes, we don't have a relationship. He lives in some old folks home. And he says he sometimes goes to see him just here and there, but he's not making much of an effort. But uh, he said that it just falls away. And he actually said to your listeners, to anyone listening to this, if you're having trouble and you're feeling like you should move on from something, but you just can't, he said, don't get frustrated with yourself. Just know that it might take time, more time than you want it to, but eventually all of that will fall away and you'll be able to move on, which is very different from what you and I are saying that it requires yeah. some work and you got to, <laughs> yeah. and, and he's stressing, just give it time. So I don't know if there's room for both. But... Do you think, I, I guess I wouldn't clarify, I wouldn't, I wouldn't qualify it as doing work, but do you think over time, and may, maybe this is what people mean by time heals all wounds, but your brain is actually is actually doing the work in the in in the back it's just kind perhaps of, yeah it's working through this stuff right you know yeah but I, yeah. I don't know if you can call that work like it's doing it kind of on its own right maybe or the work but, that you're doing is giving you a perspective and almost like yeah, I, mean, I, I imagine yeah, like yeah. uh kevin from home alone saying i'm not afraid anymore do you hear yeah. me i'm not afraid anymore and if there's a little, little louis in his mind saying that to his father now of I'm not afraid of you anymore, Mm -hmm. you know, because of the growing and the living that he's done. So. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there are little pieces of work in the middle that break down the barriers to allow your brain to move, to move forward in the, in the background to get you to that place where you're not, Mm -hmm. you're not afraid and you don't maybe even know it until you're confronted with it. Until you're confronted with it. But your brain's moved you there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a it's a realization that you do feel like shouting, like Kevin. Anyways, that's not quite apples to apples to seeing your parents horrifically murdered in your whole life. No, you know, wiped out in one fell swoop. No, but, and I don't think it's really a spoiler to say that he, you know, he's struggling with this in the forest, and he struggles with this for for some time. 
um, you know, you can see that he's, I, I, one of the reasons I brought that up about, you know, the wounds being healed or not over time is, you know, you can see he's still struggling with it. This is roughly, you know, I think, what, 13-ish thir years later, based on what Chronicler guesses Quoth's age to be. Yeah, 25 or so. Right. Um, and he's still, you know, he's still breaking down outside, you know, after right. reading the story. And much like the music, maybe maybe you don't hear a story like that without breaking down a little bit, right? But mm -hmm. um, yeah, he still went on to do great things that we know yep, of. Sure. Became this legendary figure. Um, yeah. So there's some strength in that too, of yeah. being able to channel your energy into something productive and move forward, mm -hmm. but still at the, at the same time, allowing yourself to feel every once in a while. And yet he won't show that. Nope. To Bast uh, or to Chronicler. Um, Bast and Chronicler do have a, you know, a little moment when both leaves, just kind of talking to each other and getting on slightly better terms. <laughs> it's also kind of revealed that we talked about this a little bit last time. The relationship with Bast and Quoth is interesting, right? It, he's, you know, Quoth is the mentor, but also Bast feels like he's taking care of Quoth in some ways. And, you know, he, he says, don't, don't, don't mention the bruise on my wrist from when he grabbed me. He'll, he'll only feel bad. Right. He's, he's worried about his mood being so dark. And Bast is, he's very much in some sort of protective role with Quoth. And we know from an earlier chapter in this we cover here that he's been with Quoth for basically the full two years right. since the events ended, right after it, maybe. Yet he's um, much older than Quoth, too. Way older. Yeah. In the hundreds of years older, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and still he's kind of in this protective role. Yeah. I, I wonder wonder how he found him. Yeah, a part of me wonders if like Quoth needs a student. He needs someone he can pour his energy into and be strong for. Mm. So I'm gonna be the student because that's what he needs right now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And you could, you know, I maybe I wouldn't have chosen just the word student, but he's got ego. He needs attention. And yeah. maybe Bast knows too that if he goes and pretends to be this other person that nobody knows, he's gonna suffer. Cause he needs some he needs someone to recognize his greatness, to know that it's right. in there and who he is. So I'll, I'll be, that, I'll be guy. that person, maybe mm -hmm. uh, until you, you get the sense that Bast wants wants that innkeeper to fade away and for both to come back a little bit, but we'll see where that goes. Yep. Yep. You got anything well, else on this uh, interlude? I think that's the theme of this episode, and maybe the all of them that we've done for the King Killer Chronicle so far is we'll see where that goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it could be past theme too for <laughs> the third book, Doors of Stone, which <laughs> right. we're all waiting for. <clears throat> oh. We'll, we'll go see where dark? that goes. Yes, let's do it. So, Kalisar. This is where we get spoilery. So if you're reading along with us, which poor you if you are, I mean, come on, people. You got to wait a month between episodes. But Go uh, faster. Yeah, this is like, uh, this is why I wait till all the episodes of Yellowstone are out before I watch <laughs> a full season. Um, anyways, join us next time, please, as we cover another 40-ish pages. That's something me and Scott need to do. We need to, like, establish... Here's what we're here's yeah. Here's what each episode's gonna be. Rita but came uh, after for, after us for it this week. She's like, "Where's your Rita, schedule?" Sorry, you are right. You are right to hold our feet to the fire a little bit. You're correct. No, it's forty ish pages, and wherever chapters line up within that forty ish pages, that's what we'll be doing. Also, uh, Rita, thanks for listening. Love it, love it, love to know. Please reach out. Let us know if you enjoy this stuff, uh, and if you're enjoying our coverage of it, like we are. Um, let's move into the spoilers though. Are you ready? There's a lot. I'm ready. I don't know if we have, I don't know if we have the energy to cover all of it, but let's, let's see where we go. It is quite late, but here it we is. are. Devi after are. dark. Devi after dark. 
what okay. speaks to you, Matt? Where do you want to what what do you want to know? What do you what do you want to go through? There's a few things that I wrote down. Um so obviously Chandrian stuff. Uh the story of Lanre, which is obviously that's key to the Chandrian as well. Yes. Um Knowing Lanre's story, Ben says, might give you some perspective. That's yeah. all he tells him. Uh, Lanre, and then I see you put a note down here, Lanre's story and perspective. Um, we all know that Lanre is Lord Haliax. Mm-hmm. Right? And um, that's kind of the beginning of the Chandrian, as far as we understand it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, You know, maybe just brief history for those that have read it and maybe just don't remember. I certainly had forgotten. Lonry was a badass warrior. He fought against the enemy of what was then, you know, thousands of years ago we're talking about here. But it was called the Ergen Empire. Um, And there were knowers and shapers. And the knowers knew the names of things, but kind of let them be. And the shapers like to manipulate and create and modify things that they knew the names of. Um, and they were fighting a war and the knowers were losing this war, but Lonre kind of came to came to the rescue because he was so great with his sword and he had a wife, Lyra, who was also awesome. Um, she was a powerful namer. So they gave hope to the cities of the Urgan Empire. Eventually that war culminated in a big battle uh, called the Battle of uh, Dross and Tor, I believe it is. Um, and he they won that battle. He killed a great beast, but he died during it. And Lyra had to bring him back to life. Literally, he was dead, and she had to bring him back to life. Um, and so the people were hopeful again, and they thought they could win the war. And it did look actually like that was going to happen. Then something weird happened, and Lyra got sick. We don't know a lot. And Lonre, through through that sickness or death of Lyra, turned on them and started just destroying the cities. And it culminated in a showdown with another really powerful neighbor named Salitos, one of the most powerful dudes in history, in which Lonre admitted he had no purpose in life and there was no joy in it since Lyra was gone and he could not bring her back. Um, and he asked Salitos to kill him. Um, Salitos can't kill him or won't. And he forces Salitos to watch his own city burn. He reveals his new name, Haliax, like you said, Matt. Um, and Salitos blinds himself with a rock for failing to see Lonre for who he really was. And then he puts a curse on Haliax and all those who follow him. Specifically for Haliax, uh, by having his face be always held in shadow, which I think we just saw. Yep. At the wagons. So it's a very fast history, not as fast maybe as someone would have liked. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about it again. It's going to come up in the next episode or two as well. Um, so we'll cover different parts of it probably, but essentially Lowry became Haliax, the original member of the Chandrian that we see in control of, you know, both fate here. And, you know, he's, you know, in that story, in that history, it basically says he's interested in killing the world. He's interested in sowing salt. So nothing grows. Yeah. There's no purpose. There's nothing, nothing that can, nothing good can come from this world. Um, and so you think maybe that's their purpose. It fe- it feels like, but then there's also this specific curse that Salidos lays on them. And part of it is this is my doom upon you and all who follow you. May it last until the world ends and the Aliu fall nameless from the sky. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if maybe their primary purpose is just to, to to end the curse, right? To to remove these uh, the, the curse that's upon them, and to do that they need to end the world and make the Aliu fall nameless from the sky. We don't know what the Aliu are, as far as my research went. I couldn't find it anywhere. I feel like, I mean, I have some theories, but they're you know they're guesses more than anything. Um, Aleph is kind of the creator of the world. Alu is spelled very similarly to Aleph. He, in one of the stories, promotes uh, seven or eight people 
to be what are essentially angels. They have wings and everything. Right. Gods are angels. And and in the story we get, he names every single one of them. We have the list of names. And so I thought maybe that's a hint falling nameless from the sky. They're angels with wings. Mm, Maybe mm -hmm. they're the LU. Um, There's also the shapers put stars in the sky before the this big war that Lonnery was a part of. Maybe the alley were the stars of the shapers. And so they're saying, until there are no more shapers like you, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna, you know, you're you're gonna be cursed. But it's very we, biblical too. Like you read about stuff like that in the book of Revelation of yes. and it's just kind of almost symbolic of just like the world ending or yes. Or and the Halliax, fact that they will never fall from the sky. And so it's never ending. But and Halliax, I thought might very well be you know like a satan type figure that you know satan was a fallen angel right right uh, what was his name was it, he had a lucifer lucifer cheese can't believe i forgot that <laughs> wow so lucifer was a you know a fallen angel right and i wondered if lonre so lonre in his history that i just gave he wanted very much to try to revive his wife lyra right and it says in there, Salito says something, or he says to Salito that he, he went and got, you know, information that was dangerous, um, or dangerous to get that information, or dangerous to have it. And I wondered if maybe, um, you know, he went and and talked to Kthay, the magical tree that we haven't met yet, uh, that can tell the future, and got information and power from it. A lot of people theorize this in this fandom. Um, but that in so doing, he kind of became like a fallen angel, right? And right. Mm-hmm. Haliax is very much a Lucifer type figure, uh, you know, that's fallen away from, you know, these high quality character people. His name is Haliax. The villain that started the creation war is named Ajax. Um, Ajax. Ajax and Haliax. Hal, Hal means, the, the prefix Hal means like breath. So like I thought maybe somehow he went to try to get Lyra reborn and made some sort of pact with Ajax. Yeah, and deal with the like devil. Imbued with him, right? There's actually, mm-hmm. we talked about the Alar for Quoth maybe, of being two people. Like maybe Ajax is like in there with him. Right. It's like the, the yeah. breath of Ajax, right? Right. Yeah. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot there and a lot of it's, very piecemeal and not a lot of evidence just kind of you know it's fun though it is fun uh yeah i've come to some i've come to some thoughts and and opinions on this stuff over the last day as i've (laughs) really been researching this closer so but uh go ahead so any ideas on who they're running from, or I think you articulated really well what their purpose could be, but uh, it seems like right now they might just be in survival mode. Yeah. um, A little bit. So the angels, um, when Aleph promotes the, some of the, um, some of the people to angels, it's noted that they're not allowed to, they're not allowed to proactively seek them out and punish them. They can only judge on the things that they've seen them do. And so I think the angels are always watching. Um, there's a part in there where Cinder says, uh, you were as good as a watcher, Haliax. Right. Yep. Um, which, you know, I think means you're you're as worthless as an angel. One of those watcher types that don't ever do anything. They just watch and they never accomplish anything is my take on that sentence. And the, yeah, it's the angels that they're running from. There's also the Amur, who are supposedly extinct, but maybe not. Um, you know, Ch- Haliax specifically mentions them as somebody he's keeping them safe from. So they could, they're, they're running from them too, I think. Um, but we don't know much about the Amur yet. Um, the book does, the second book does talk about the Cthay, the magic tree, talks to, talks to uh, both and tells them if you stay near this guy, Mayor Alberton, he'll lead you to the the doors of of the Amir, something like that. Paraphrasing. Yeah, certainly. Mm-hmm. And 
So they're 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 in the world somewhere, and we don't know much about them yet. But I think they're running from probably both of those things. Feels to me like the Ammer are more proactive. They don't have to wait and see. They're just gonna they're more like vigilantes of justice, and they're gonna go do whatever they need to do to to punish the Chandrian. Um, the angels are they have to wait and see and punish them when they see a bad deed. Yeah. And so that hiding stuff is all like, oh, they're coming to try to pin this on us. They're watching. They saw something. Let's go and not be be caught, right? Mm -hmm. So they flee. So that's yeah, that's what I imagine they're running from. Um, you know how X kind of says who they're who's protecting them from. I imagine it's them, and that's a lot. I know that was only one topic for Debbie After Dark, but it it was a lot. Uh, I think it kind of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's what we were looking for and that's yeah. obviously the big questions that are brought up in this one yeah um i guess i'm still wondering why they why they're chasing down people that talk about them too much yeah because that seems like revealing yourself is almost a danger if you're yeah. revealing yourself to kill the people that are talking about you just let yeah. yourself live as a legend you know this is a so it's a great question. And I thought about that some too, and I, th I don't have anything from the books to say it, but they're playing a very long game. This is, they've been around, you know, Haliak has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. And I come back to this name thing and how important names are and mm -hmm. wiping the names and images away. And I wonder if, if the names disappear from recorded history and no one knows them anymore, Mm -hmm. if maybe no one will have if the Amer and other namers won't have power over them right if they can reduce the power that these groups that are chasing them have if they can remove their names from recorded history now that would be that's a long long game to play right, right? Yeah. but like if you're tormented then no forever one anyway if you're tormented forever anyway what else are you going to do right well okay what what am I going to do I can you know just sit here and while away the hours and do nothing or i guess i can try to end this state i'm in and oh maybe the only way i can do that is to remove my name so that no one knows it and no one can say it no one can learn it yeah and no one can no one can control me with it that's a satisfying um, answer yeah uh no, it is. <laughs> it's it's an with answer. with what we know it's satisfying yeah yeah i came off as a little sarcastic i didn't mean if, it to <laughs> Well, that's a satisfying answer. I maybe, was actually being sincere. Maybe, maybe one, <laughs> one more little piece to it. So, if nobody says their name, so if if the Chandrian can hear their names and be summoned, mm -hmm. perhaps the names are also like, you know, little blips to the angels that are watching as well, right? And so, if nobody ever says the names anymore, then the angels don't have any sort of trigger to find them, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so they can go do their deeds and no one knows their names. And so the angels never find them doing their deeds to bring destruction to the rest of the world, which is the second half of that prophecy, right? You've got it until the world ends and until these Alu fall from the sky nameless. So if they can remove their names from history, no one says their names, they can go about doing their other work of destroying the world without as much danger maybe without anyone to oppose them yeah right mm -hmm. maybe yeah it's way far thin i think considering what we know that's pretty darn good explanation i like it thanks i put some thought into it there's other stuff on waystones we can cover all that later if those gray stones are going to come up lots of times yep uh anything on bast anything more on him um we spent some time in previous debbies talking about him yeah i don't have much on bast um you know i think we we know here that he quote specifically says you've been with me like a little less than two years we've heard before that you know all this stuff happened two years ago and mm -hmm. so it feels like Bast joined him afterward, not before. So that's maybe an interesting little tidbit. He wasn't part of King Killing. He wasn't part of 
maybe whatever happened, he joined afterward for some reason we don't know yet. Yeah. But that's, that's all I really got. And an apology that I don't, you know, I said he was a demon. I don't think he is. <laughs> no. I want to believe he's good. It would be fun. Ben's note. Mm -hmm. Defend yourself well at the university. Yeah. Thoughts? Um, it could mean a few things. Um, literally, it could, you know, they have um, classes kind of like, um, you know, wizarding school, um, you know, where you're kind of doing mock battles and things like that. Um, there's also against other students, right? So we could be talking about that, but I doubt it. There's also um, the sense that uh, it, it's, it's a very kind of, um, it's a process full of conflict to get into the university, to stay there. You have to prove yourself every semester. And yeah. like if defending you a thesis almost. Almost, yeah, right. Defend yourself well. But I think the our I think Ben knows how hard the university will be for someone like Quoth, someone without an upbringing, someone or you know a, a noble upbringing, um, someone without a lot of money or advantages. And I th think he knows the trappings of the rich. I think he's actually talking about protect yourself from mm -hmm. all of the dangers at the university. But that's it's a reach too. That's yeah. my that's my impression. What do right. you think? Kind of the same. Yeah. Defend who you are at yeah. the university. Don't let it change you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think he very much wants Quoth to attack things with those hungry eyes, you know, mm -hmm. that his mom mentioned. Yeah. And Defend not lose yourself. that enthusiasm. Right? Defend yeah. yourself. Not just mm -hmm. defend yourself, defend yourself, stay who you are. I like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Re remember your father's song. Yeah. This is a song that he's only learned a verse of. Ben's only heard a verse of this song. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Cautionary tale? I, I kind of see it as a cautionary tale. He sees in Lon Ray, or he sees in Quoth what Lon Ray legendarily started out as. And that fall can be long and hard. Can be brutal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I. It's interesting. You know, the, the song that he sings, you know, I read it here. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even call out any of the Chandrian's names. Sure. By name. And so I wonder if we didn't hear it. Patrick, Patrick didn't show it to us. But I wonder if over the weeks that followed, you know, if if actually he did hear more of the song and knows more. But Ben wouldn't have known that because Ben left that night. So, right. yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I, I don't understand what about that song summoned Ben. It makes me feel like there were more in-depth conversations with names being had because he only mentioned, uh, you know, he only he mentions says the Land Ray one time. One and time, it's not even his name anymore. He did. Quoth does say that he that mom and dad talked about it a lot. Yeah, so that's maybe true. just them talking about it. Yeah, did it would put a blip on the radar. You know. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's true. And yet, Cinder says somebody's parents have been singing the wrong sorts of songs. Right. Adds the singing part. So maybe right. he's practicing or whatever. Yeah. Singing. Yeah. You get the sense that he's referring to the performance, but maybe not. Yeah, remember your father's song. It's inter It's almost. It's almost. Um, you know, a, a bit fortune telly. You know, like he didn't know that his parents were about to get killed, but it becomes prophecy almost. Remember the song that your dad sung in order to mm -hmm. find your destiny of you know chasing down the Chandrian, but that hadn't happened yet. So Ben. Why did he tell him to remember the song? Right. Just for what I think maybe just for what you said. Lan Lanray's fall, right? Cautionary fall. tale. Yeah, cautionary tale. 
I also yeah. wonder, although this isn't as fun, if it's beyond the content of the song and just the overall concepts behind the song of mm. work hard to get it right. Don't reveal your cards too soon. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're going to do something, go all the way on it, get it right. Yeah. And just those principles, not concepts, but principles that his father demonstrated in writing this big, what he wanted to be kind of, I think he wanted it to kind of be his opus, yeah, his perfect song. Yeah, yeah. very much. That's good. Yeah. that Yeah. I hadn't thought of that either, but yeah, very, very much could be remember, remember what it is to be, to be Rue, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And putting in the work and doing, you know doing your art there's value in that right yeah yeah through all this science and everything that they're going to try to shove into you at the university and all of that stuff yeah look at the music man right yeah yeah and as we'll see he does not nope thank goodness thank goodness and then finally be wary of folly yeah which which adds some weight and meaning to him naming the sword folly. Which leads me to believe that he sees maybe that martial, physical, you know, violence and all of that yeah. is folly. And did he name it that after or before? Right. When did he and get that name? It, and do it anyway. Mm-hmm. This is my yeah. sword folly. That's funny. And then he does it anyway. Mm-hmm. Or is it like a the name that came up afterward. Yeah. Agreed. Same question there. Yep. Hmm. Well, well, we leave Debbie after dark with potentially more questions than we had when we came in. Yeah. We got to stop doing that. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe someone should finish writing the books. There we go. There we go. We do this to ourselves. Gad. We have no one to blame, but us. We picked it. There are a lot of series that are complete that we could 100% just do from start to finish and have all the answers to. Yeah, they aren't this good. <laughs> In my opinion, I'm a sucker for this book for sure. But Yeah, I'm definitely enjoying going through it as carefully as we are. Good. It's definitely enriching. So, Yeah, I've, I've, I really enjoyed the last couple of days re- trying to look deeper at some of these things. Right. Uh, that I never did before in my first two read-throughs. So. Yep. It's been rewarding. Yeah. Shall we sign All right. off? Shall we? Let us sign off. Um, where was... I'll edit all this out. Uh, yep, I'm going to do this one. This is Matt signing off. This, this uh, lyric struck me. It's from 311 known for their deep and introspective lyrics mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i don't know if i've ever used a 311 lyric on this podcast before i here we go 311 up with a bunch of other bands oh i'm sorry i have a soft okay. spot for those fellas yeah remember kalasar is well this is matt signing off reminding you that the river cuts its way through stone not through sheer force but persistence at the end of the day the relentless always win so stick with it I think that's what the Chandrian are doing. Mm-hmm. I thought of that with slowly pulling their names out of history, going at it uh, with Quoth's dad, mm-hmm. both himself, you know, all of this. I love it. Yep. I love it. Uh, mine is, uh, is simple. Uh, it's from that last chapter. Uh, it is when Cinder, when you see Cinder for the first time, and he says, well, you have to cut this out now, too, because I lost it. <laughs> Make us want it. It was right here. Ah. He relaxed when he saw me. He dropped the tip of his sword and smiled with perfect ivory teeth. It was the expression a nightmare war. Expression a nightmare. That's it. 
now I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Dang it. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Yep. Matt, it's a joy as always. A joy. Have a pleasant evening, my friend. Uh, A pleasant morning. Morning. It's morning. It's 105 Mountain Standard Time, Kalasar. That is correct. This is how we do it. Okay. This is how we do it. All right. I like it a lot. Okay. Bye. That's your song. That's the one that makes you, if you don't feel something listening to that song, you're not human. (laughs) I don't, I I couldn't even tell you the name of that song. I think it's called, this is how we do it. I just told you the name of that song. (laughs) Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.